Let's do jazz hands, man. Can I get jazz hands? Look at that. Adam <laughs> Kraut is doing jazz hands on the show. One time all, only. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. One time only. We are live from the Big Daddy Gun Studios. I'm Hank Strange. This is the Who Moved My Freedom podcast. I believe this is episode 85. And our special guest tonight is this gentleman, Adam Kraut Esquire. <laughs> I always I always wanted to say that. You know, I'm I'm a big fan of Bill and Ted. Okay. <laughs> I uh <laughs> I actually watched Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure like two weeks ago. It's, it's a great on Netflix. Movie. Yeah, is it Netflix? wait, is it on Netflix or Amazon Prime? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah I think it's on Amazon because I, I watched it. I definitely watched it. Yes. Okay. I, I love both of I love it's both a good of movie. them. Yes, those are good movies. Probably the the best stuff Keanu Reeves has ever done, including including um what's his name uh, john wick <laughs> yeah i no i i would agree early keanu reeves in, in bill and ted is yeah, yeah. Uh, i'm down classic with it. classic stuff okay so i'm gonna um you know do some housekeeping stuff here i'd like to welcome everyone that's watching the show right now um we've got we've got a bunch of folks in the chat uh what's up to all you guys i'm gonna do a shout out here in a second i want to remind everyone to click the thumbs up button and uh, share this video with your family and friends. I know a lot of folks would like to um, have the opportunity to ask Adam questions um, about a lot of different things, <laughs> you know? And so this is your opportunity right here to ask Adam questions. So you guys, the guys in the chat, just uh, hit me up with those. You might have to give them to me a couple times. Lola's not here, so I might get caught up talking to Adam. Um. Um, I know how you know. hard that can be. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You know how that is. So I'll try first, to scan them too. I'll, I'll, I'll help out. Yeah, absolutely. And first, I want to thank all the folks that support us on Patreon. We're Patreon slash Hank Strange. Um, do you have any things like that you want to plug at the top of the show here, Adam? Uh, I mean, anybody who's a you know on a TGC fan or watches this over on TGC, the Gun Collective, uh, this week in guns, we like shooting. Uh, you know, anybody where I've I've met people before. Hello, great to see you all again. Absolutely, and uh, shout out to the Gun Collective and John. We are we are trying to get John to come on. <laughs> We're working on that, so don't worry. We'll we'll figure out a, a way to make it happen. Um, you know, and in the the link in the description to this video, there is a link to um, to the I guess it's the page that you have that for running for the NRA board 2018. Yeah, so the the website uh, adamkraut.com. Yes, yep. absolutely. So if you folks want to go there and get more information on Adam or figure out how to help him out, please do that. Uh, let me shout out everyone that's in the chat right now. Greg 98 K. He was number one in the chat. What's up? Uh, nice. Bob, Bob Bluntman, uh, Chris Bullis, intro zoo 76. I don't know if you recognize any of these names, Adam. No. <laughs> uh, yeah. TJ blaze. <clears throat> Also in the chat, there's like a whole bunch of people that just jumped into the chat. So let me see. I'm trying to go through here. The Tyvin Show is in. Gerald Weldon, Highway Run 77, E Rock, Gorillas and Guns, E Hans 5000, Sergeant Hulk is Big Toe, Freedom <laughs> Work, <laughs> Rod Mills. These are interesting. I like this part where I shout out all the people hanging out in the chat. Scott Kimball, uh, Lead Devil, Shut Up and Play Your Guitar, Joe Nutson. Um, Let's see who else is in here. MW Tactical. So there you go. Uh, Freedom Work. There's a lot of people. I'm sure I'm missing folks. If you want me to specifically give you a shout out, just do a roll call and I will definitely shout you out. Also, guys, like I said, um, you know, let us know what questions and things like that you have for Adam. I think I've got a few and I'll go through those. You know, um, Adam, before we get into it, is there anything you want to say? No, uh, it's good. It's good to be here. New venue for me, so it's always fun, uh, you know, yeah. participating in podcasts that I haven't before. Yeah, so I'm looking forward so, to it. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, we're kind of like you know, wild and loose. <laughs> cool. We're, we're a bunch of crazy guys over here. It's just me I, and you. I, I um, know everybody thinks lawyers are these stiff, unfun people, and that may be true for I don't know, ninety nine point nine percent of them. But I'm kind of the guy who's like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, and you're specifically a firearms lawyer, right? Is that your? Yeah. Yeah. So how can that be boring? <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> uh, you'd be surprised. Really? <laughs> oh, into, okay. <laughs> when you get into the real like technical uh, rules and procedural stuff, yeah, that's not fun. But oh, okay. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, I guess that, uh, you know, I guess in my mind, I think it, it, it'll be more fun. Okay. So let's start with who you are, what's your background, education, et cetera. Sure. So uh, I guess for those that don't know, I am Adam Kraut. Um, I am from Pennsylvania, Southeast Pennsylvania, grew up here, uh, was, was born here, grew up here. I uh, lived here pretty much my entire life except for college where uh, I went to undergrad at SUNY Binghamton just over the border in New York. And for those of you that are not from New York and not from that area, you'd probably be surprised to find out that they call that upstate New York, uh, even though f Pennsylvania is 15 miles south. And that was very confusing oh. to me until I learned that the world revolves around New York City, according to New Yorkers, and everything <laughs> yes, north of that is upstate, uh, yeah. which would be the entire rest of the state. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> after that, I uh, graduated, I came back home, and I went to uh, law school as a night student at Widener down in Wilmington, and uh, that's where I learned to be a lawyer, uh, as best they teach you in law school, which is not very all that well. Um, they don't actually teach you anything practical. It's more of a way to just uh, defraud you of money for four years and then send you on your way with the degree. Uh -huh. <laughs> it's a racket. Yeah, I'm a little bitter about the process, but the free <laughs> coffee at night was good, so uh, I can't complain about that. Lots of people are bitter about that process. <laughs> you know, Justifiably um, so. Yeah, so I, I guess as far as like growing up and stuff, I grew up in a house that didn't have guns. Um, my Nobody in my family was a hunter. Nobody in my family was a shooter. Uh, I actually learned to shoot guns in Boy Scouts down at Camp Horseshoe in Rising Sun, Maryland. I was okay. 10 maybe. It was my first my first year as an actual Boy Scout, not a Cub Scout. I was, I think, 10. And um, it was a bold action Marlin 22. And I just remember this stupid smile I had that was off, you know, on my face after I shot that rifle, and it's kind of been downhill ever since. So I turned 18, bought a shotgun, was told to get rid of it. As you probably guessed, I still have that shotgun, so that didn't work. Mm -hmm. uh, turned 21, bought a handgun, was told that I was going to get myself killed by getting a carry permit. Um, and that obviously hasn't happened because I'm still here. So over the course of time, one of the things that I found was that uh, my parents not having any experience with guns, their perception of it was all based on on the news and where they where they grew up. Um, and it, it took a long time, but over time I was able to slowly, you know, once they started to be willing to listen, educate them. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm happy to say that their opinion has shifted drastically. They went from non-gun owners to being gun owners to having carry permits to holding a very different opinion on it than when, uh, you know, when I was younger, mm -hmm. um, which is one of the things that we'll talk about with the NRA and education later on. But it's one of the things I think is really important is that uh, a lot of this is from an uneducated, non-experienced standpoint. Um, so anyway, so I, you know, after I graduated law school, uh, well, actually, while I was still in law school, I was like, getting towards the end, like, oh, crap, I'm going to need a job because I can't put off life any longer here. Um, so I sent an email to the law firm I currently work at asking, hey, do you guys have any internships? And, uh, you know, we went back and forth and I got, uh, well, you know, sorry, we can't afford to pay you for an internship. But I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. You don't understand. I'm looking for an internship. <laughs> yeah, a real, like what it used uh, to uh, mean. Like an internship. So yeah. uh, they said, yeah. So they, uh, you know, extended me the invitation to come. Um, I was able to come and go as I pleased. I found that I fit in very well. Uh, my boss has been an awesome mentor to me. He's taken a lot of time out of his incredibly busy schedule to not only teach me the things he knows, but also um, work with me to help me with my skills. Uh, so I, I couldn't have asked for a better teacher, somebody who's willing to show me the ropes and, and not just say, here, you're going to research this stuff for the next five years before we even talk about you doing anything. Um, so off into the deep end of the pool I went. Uh, I've been doing everything at the state level from when gun trust prior to ATF 41F were we're still going good, gun trust, to advising people whether or not they're prohibited, uh, challenging erroneous denials, uh, license to carry issues. Uh, okay, so your, your firm handles firearm stuff, or is it just you at the oh, firm? So the firm itself is a general practice firm. Uh, it does pretty much everything except for employment and like bankruptcy. But my boss, Josh, um, because of his interest in firearms, developed an entire area of practice around firearms. So when he started, it was originally him doing like work comp, social security, disability, and this firearm stuff was on the side. And as that kept growing, that took up more and more of his time to where now that's all he does and that's all I do. Um, so if you ask me to do something related to like a criminal offense, like, yeah, I'll, I'll give you the guy's number you should call, but I, I don't know, just don't talk to the police. I, I got yeah. about that much. <laughs> um, 
So, so for the guys out there who want to know, um, and I'm going to ask some a couple of my questions before I get into other folks' questions, but do please uh, lodge those questions there. I'll try to go through everything and we'll answer it as best as we can. Um, something I think that folks out there will probably want to know is what kind of gun guy are you, right? Especially you're running for the board and one of the things that you're saying, and, I've, and I voted for you when you ran this year at the NRA convention. Right the annual meeting. So one of the things is that, um, you know, are you a gun guy and what kind of gun guy are you? Do you represent the new gun guy out there? Right. Do you understand what I'm saying with that? So is the, really like in other words, it's the really that, heavily engraved metal <laughs> side by side shotgun that I don't have in my safe what you're asking about. Uh, I'm a guy who loves SBRs and silencers. If I could afford a machine gun, I'd own a machine gun. The reality is I can't, uh, so I don't have one. Um, Would you like to have one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, 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 if we could, if machine guns were, were readily available to purchase over the counter, all that would be in my safe would be machine guns. Now I probably wouldn't be able to afford them as a machine, shoot them as a machine gun all the time. But hey, um, yeah. you know I, they they would absolutely be machine guns. The uh, everybody the the whole form one thing that you may remember when uh, ATF had approved several form ones to make machine guns for trusts. Mm -hmm. That whole idea originated out of Josh and at, at the law office I work at. Like that's you know he has a twenty millimeter Lottie on his back credenza. Oh um, my goodness. If I if I <laughs> shared an office with somebody like that, and I held an opinion that really no only firearms that should be protected are going to be our side-by-side -side shotguns for hunting doves, I don't think I'd have a job very long. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, the, the reason this why... Is my, this is my carry gun. Yeah, what's your carry gun there? It looks uh, like a Glock. It's, it's, yeah, it's been a... For the last year or so, it's been a Vickers Glock 19, uh, and this is um, Filster's new Spotlight holster that I've been waiting very patiently for uh, with an X300 on it, so... Um, you know, I, I am a gun guy through and through. I was a gun guy before I started practicing law, uh, before I started doing anything with uh, the legal brief, and certainly before I decided to run for the board. Right. Yeah, because, you know, I know some people are like, well, and I think this came out of the whole roundtable thing, which I guess we'll talk about a little bit. Sure. Um, you know, and I saw some people making the comments like, who's this guy and why should we support him? you know, to go on the NRA board? I think it's a valid question. Absolutely. You know, what? how would you answer that question to folks out there that want to know why they should support you for that? Sure. So, I mean, there's, there's a couple of different reasons. Uh, I mean, one, I like to believe I represent a number of people who are like me that were, uh, you know, I wasn't even born when the Hughes Amendment happened. I was born a couple of months later. Uh, you know, I think that people should be able to own machine guns. I think that the NFA shouldn't exist. Uh, you know, I, I, I believe those things and I actively work in my day-to-day -day life to fight those things. You know, I sue the federal government quite a bit. We're currently litigating uh, four Second Amendment as applied challenges trying to restore individuals' rights to own and, uh, firearms and possess ammunition. Um, you know, I represent FFLs who are on the offside of compliance with ATF. I've drafted comments in opposition to proposed rulemakings like ATF's uh, attempted ban on M855. I wrote a very lengthy comment on that, uh, that I spent a lot of my time unpaid to research and, and write a very, uh, what I believe to be a, a good comment. Um, I, you know, represented industry members writing comments in opposition to proposed rules. The uh, did it for dead air in relation to the marking of silencers and whether it should be mandatory in certain locations. So. Okay. Um, you know, those are all valid questions, but I also think I have some ideas that I can bring to the NRA, as well as the ability to listen to others who are there and, and you know, think about what they have to say. And, okay, is there a place for that? Is there not a place for that? How can I possibly tweak that? Um, you know, I'm somebody who will work with someone else unless it's such an abhorrent position, like we should make sure machine guns are always banned. Okay, well, I don't agree with that, so I'm not going to find a way to work with you on that. Right. If it's we need to take a chip out of this wall before we go to the next step to take a bigger chip, then okay, I think there's some sense in that because going for the whole pie doesn't necessarily bode well with everyone. It might be easier to get somebody on the other side to compromise if it's less of a leap for them. Um, and, you know, there's a couple other things that are coming up. Uh, I've drafted some proposed, uh, I might as well just say it here because uh, it's not public yet. I've drafted some proposed amendments to the bylaws to help the organization, what I believe would help the organization as far as structure, as far as uh, the individuals who run it. 
Uh, so you can probably expect to see those within the next week. Okay. Um, you know, so I, I'm, I'm also actively doing things to show that I want to be a productive board member. Meanwhile, it seems like, and it's a very valid question to ask me what I bring to the table. I, th I think that's only fair because I am asking for people's support in it. Um, and sometimes it, it seems like without seeing what everyone else gets asked or if anyone else gets asked at anything that I'm always the guy who's getting asked questions. Um, but you have to realize there's two ways you can appear on the ballot. One is by petition, which is how I ran. So I had to go out and this time it's 653 signatures I had to collect in order to make the ballot. Last year okay. it was 250. Wow. Um, so they made it more difficult uh, because they realized there's some people. And I think there's people in the NRA that refer to those of us that want to change things. Trojans, <laughs> infiltrators, uh, talking, talking infidels. About Hammer's letter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, the, the bylaws changes as a whole had some things in it that were designed to protect the organization. The, the petition process, at, even at 250 signatures, was a pretty, even in today's day, the internet was not exactly a, a cakewalk. Um, but now it's half a percent of the total number of people who cast a ballot in the previous election. So this past year, 653. The next two elections, usually more people historically have voted for those cycles. So that number is going to go up. Um, there are five candidates this year who successfully collected enough signatures by petition to be placed on the ballot. That's down, uh, it's 50% of what it was last year. Wow, uh, okay. Two so. people, yeah, so it's, it's half. Two yeah. people ran by petition only. I was one of them. There's another gentleman from South Carolina whom I'm not familiar with. And three of the current directors um, also ran by petition and were successful in collecting signatures. And I know there were a couple other directors collecting signatures who did not collect enough. So that probably tells you something about the process right there. It's not that easy. Um, so that's one way. The other way is for your name to be placed in front of the nominating committee and they review a bunch of people's names and they end up selecting some. Uh, there's 37 people on the ballot this year and that would mean 35 of them were nominated by uh, the nominating committee. Um, three of them were nominated by petition and the nominating committee. Uh, and then two of us were um, by petition okay. only. So how many, so here's the thing, and I think I saw someone, and, and specifically when I say someone, I'm talking about Yankee Marshall. Mm -hmm. I, I think I saw him say, like, you know, why is putting Adam Kraut, this one dude on the NRA board, how is that going to influence anything? So how would you respond to that? And then also, like, how many people do you think we need to get on the board to change things? Do you think it's one person or is there some kind of uh, magical number that we need to get to? No, it's it's certainly not one person. And I've never once claimed to be the guy that's going to change everything. So if anybody out there has perceived that, um, I've never said that. Uh, nor, nor do I want you to infer that. I'm just a guy, and I've said repeatedly, the board is made up of 76 members. 75 mm -hmm. serve a three-year term, one person serves a one-year term, and they're voted on at the annual meeting. Um, so I would be one voice among 76 with an equal amount of say in what the, the vote is. My vote would count just as much as someone else's vote. So no, I'm not going to be able to walk in there and change everything. However, I can bring some ideas to the table to help change things. I can have discussions right. with people where if they're willing to listen and exchange ideas may change their line of thinking on things. I also may be a catalyst for other people to look at and go, hey, you know, I think I can do that and I think I can do that well. And I represent a lot of what these gun owners today believe. And they may decide to run for the board. And yeah. that's what needs to happen. So even if I never make it, but I inspire other people to go down this road and they do, and that keeps going, then I've succeeded in some to some degree. Yeah, um, I mean, so is there a magical number? I don't know how the voting goes. Uh, I'm assuming if you said it's like 76, then what is it? You need like 39 so, people or something like that to uh, yeah, try to I do believe, that math in my head. I have to look at the bylaws off the top of my head. I think I I think it's a majority vote on most things, so it mm -hmm. would be. Uh, this is why more I'm like, than well, half. Good at yeah, it'd be like 36, yeah. 37 people. Um, but what a lot of people don't understand or don't know is the structure of the NRA and how it works. So, you know, it's great. I'm telling you I'm running for the board and that's all well and good, but what do they actually do, right? Well, none of those other people tell you what the board does. Mm -hmm. um, 
so that's one of the things that is also part of my campaign is to educate people on what what these people actually do. Like you get this magazine in February and you open up and you go, oh, I know that name, Ted Nugent. Uh, either I like <laughs> that guy, he has awesome music, or dude's an ass. Um, or you know, you go down and you're like, oh man, Tom Selleck. I really like Tom Selleck. This is awesome. Uh, or you recognize, you know, an Olympian or a competitive shooter or, or who, whoever it is, a politician. And you, you know, you vote for that person, but you don't know what you're voting for. And right. I think that's, that's a little bit of a problem. So the board as a whole, the, the real like quick overview of this, the board is what, it, with any company, is what runs the organization as far as its long term and to some degree some of the short term goals. Um, the board for the NRA meets three times a year on a regular basis. One of those times is at the annual meeting. Uh, they also have committees. So much like Congress has a finance committee and an appropriations committee and a justice committee, NRA has, I think it's off the top of my head, I want to say it's like 30 some standing committees where these board members are broken out into where they discuss the issue at, on, at hand in that committee. So like youth shooting, for instance, or, um, you know, uh, legal. Um, and then they come back and they present reports to the board as a whole and they, they you know they have discussions and vote on things and so you break out into specialized groups with a s certain subset of knowledge and then you come back and you kind of share with everyone else what your findings were uh, much like Congress does um, and then they vote on things so you know recently it was like a bylaws change but there, there could be any number of things or motions that are put in front of the board and they also one of the big things they do is they elect the officers so the president the vice president the executive vice president um you know the people that you see like pete brownell and wayne lapierre and, and people like that the board is responsible for electing those individuals um okay. so that's also important to consider that when you're putting somebody up there to represent you they're also having a say in who those officers are and those officers are what run the day-to-day -day business in the organization so um, that's kind of like the 30,000 foot overview and it is our plan, I believe, to do some more video content on that stuff to help educate people as to the structure of the organization and how it works. So if nothing else, they just have a better idea of that. Yeah. And I think, um, I think people are trying to get an idea of what those people look like and how they think, you know, are they really FUDs as we refer to them where they're, you know, which in, in my opinion means these guys who are in there and yes, maybe they're gun guys, but they think you only need like a hunting rifle or, you know, they don't understand why we want to modify our rifles, why we want ARs, why we think uh, machine guns, you know, we should be able to own machine guns or suppressors, right? right? So, and then because they don't understand those things, they're willing to negotiate them away. Absolutely. You know? that, and that's, that's a huge problem. So, the, the NRA as a whole is the biggest gun lobby that exists currently, and it only has 5 million members, which is, when you think about it, abysmal, because there's, what, uh, I think it's an estimated 100 million? I, I might be wrong on the figure of, of, of gun Of actual owners. gun owners? Yeah, some, it, it's, it's an astronomically way bigger number than what, who, who are members of the NRA. So you have a very small sub, subset of people who feel that it's important to be part of a membership organization to protect that interest. On top of that, you have a membership organization that covers a wide diversity of individuals. Everybody from people like me who like machine guns and think that everybody should be able to own one to the dude who's like, all I need is this bolt action hunting rifle to shoot deer because that's what the Second Amendment's about. And mm. he's wrong, but we need to, on this side, defend his right to have that bolt action rifle just as much as that guy needs to defend our right to have that machine gun, regardless of whether you want one or the other. And that's the problem that the gun community has as a whole, is that the guys on one side are not always willing to stand up for the guys on the other side. If yeah. that were, if that conversation were like, you know, we weren't having that conversation, it would be gravy, but that's unfortunately not the reality. So the NRA has to, in, to some degree, represent all of these individuals. So competitive shooters, uh, you know, the, the machine gun guy, the duck hunter guy, the youth shooter, they have this huge swath of gun owners that they have to cover. And it, it, to some degree, it seems like some of it is a, a membership retention rate, like where, where it's the middle. Um, yeah. You know, so I, I, think, I, I think some of that just goes to education, educating the other guy like, hey, man, you know, your bolt action rifle is great. Here's what the Second Amendment is. Here's what it was designed to protect against. And you don't have to want to have any of that stuff. That's cool but you should be defending it or willing to defend it just as much as we would defend your gun. Absolutely. That's, that's it. Yeah, I'm, let me just take a quick break 
here for a second um, just to remind everyone to uh, thumbs up this video that helps us get get the word out to more more folks and if you can share the share the link here on your social media whatever social media you have Adam I don't know if you got a chance to do it I'm, I'm doing it right now because I, I kind of just got in here so help us out and do that also um, real Cujo just uh, donated 25 bucks to the chat thank you real Cujo uh, we appreciate that and his comment that he wants to make that's that's why he uh, donated it he says Adam Kraut for NRA board well thank you so there you go um, so thank you real Cujo that's really cool yeah so let's uh, let's make sure that we're out here um, sharing sharing up this video so we can get uh, more folks in on this and I'm probably gonna go back I know there's like a ton of things we probably want to ask Adam I don't know if we're gonna get everything answered but let me um, let me try to go in here and hit up some of the questions and I'm gonna try to do this in the order that they came in all right so Adam this one I did not plant this one I'm just telling you this that's fine <laughs> um, so this is from Enhas 5000 he says uh, he'd like to ask why I wasn't included in the gun collective roundtable? Um, he says you would have been so you would have been so much better, Hank, than some of those other idiots on the panel. His opinion, like I said, um, do you do you want to do you want to comment on that? It's inevitable we're going to talk about it, so we might as well just get yeah. it out of the way now. Yeah, so the, absolutely. The, the idea behind the panel was to have an open discussion where individuals with differing opinions could come and share their thoughts. And I'll get to you specifically in a second here, Hank. Um, mm -hmm. So that was the idea. Undeniably, you're going to get some people who have an opinion or a thought or maybe everything they say you just don't agree with. But the idea was to have a, a discussion, not say that your thought process is wrong, my thought process is right. Uh, as far as who was selected, you know, I, I don't know how that was done. It was there's only I think Google Hangouts can only have 10 people and quite honestly having sat in the panel 10 people was too many to have a a, a discussion I, I think because some people didn't have as much time to say things um, it, you know it, it's great having 10 different opinions but trying to get through them is that so um, you know I why you weren't selected or asked Hank I I don't know um, you know I certainly I'm, I'm sitting here with you so I'm certainly open to having a conversation with you um, and you know, my role at TGC is I, I kind of told you about earlier, like I write the script for the legal brief, the show that I do, I show up, I film it. I've made, I can tell you a handful of posts on Facebook and, uh, I, you know, did some other stuff with John as, you know, like B roll and stuff like that. But as far as the uh, other stuff, I don't, I don't really have a, a big part in that currently, uh, that may change in the future, but yeah, I mean, one of the things that I, that, that, um, I can say about that whole thing is I think. First of all, there were lots of good gun guys that were there, right? Mm -hmm. You know, you had, um, you had, of course, you had John, Gun Collective. That's his show. He was putting it on. But you had Mac. You had, um, you had Mike, Mr. Guns and Gear. I'm trying yep. to think who else. You know, guys who are making gun videos and all that, and and represent. Um, it was know. part part of the idea. Yeah, you had the IV eighty eight eighty eight guys. Lola's reminding me, of course. <laughs> and, and I think part of the idea was to try and not make it all just YouTube people, like people that also had some stuff within the industry itself. Right. Because if it's if it's all content creators, I mean, it's going to be kind of like, one sided. I think that's probably well, what. Uh, and by the way, John, John just uh, John from the Gun Collective, uh, or someone else from the Gun Collective. I'm assuming it's John. Just donated ten bucks to us, and he says, "Be sure to check the links in the description and support Hank Strange." There you go. John's actually watching, guys. You know, and he's supporting us. Thank you, John. But I think that that's uh, you know, that's one of the things going on here, right? If you just had a whole like all the gun guys, which by the way, we all went out there and made videos to tell everyone what we think. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, you did. Like, you know, <laughs> I mean, you just it's good that that would be a little bit crazy. I think John was trying to balance it out and have some some uh, some of the gun the YouTube gun guys and then also have some industry people you know and um, I don't know like you know what how did that whole thing go down from your perspective because from our perspective it's just a lot, a lot of drama and you know I, I um, that's that, it yeah, seems that's, real mysterious. Were you guys just innocently going into this not realizing that it was going to be like a thing? I had no idea. Um, mm -hmm. Would I have changed my opinion on going on there if I knew the fallout 
would have been what it was. No, I still would have done it um, mm-hmm. because, you know, I, I was there. I was asked questions. I expressed my uh, opinions on those questions. Yeah. And like, you're often you're often doing things with John. So, right. Well, yeah, I do stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I yeah. do do stuff with John. Yeah. And you're the legal guy. We could talk all the crap we want to. Someone actually has to talk about all the, the legal ease. Or the whatever's in the bill that you'll find out after we pass it nonsense, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, like, I I forget where where the lesson's from. Like, not everybody's going to like you or what you have to say. And if you let that bother you at night, then you're going to have a really tough life. So I, I, you know, if you didn't like what I had to say, I'm sorry. Um, But that's what I said, and, and I stand by what I said. Yeah. Um, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know anything that you. I'm trying to remember if there was any. I don't think. I can't remember you saying anything that was controversial. I mean, I think the only thing I said that people got fired up about was that if you want to change the NRA, you have to be a member of it, and in order to be a, a and you have to be a voting member because it's the only way you can vote people in and out. I don't. I don't think I ever specifically said vote for me. Mm-hmm. Um, I did mention I was running and I did talk about it, but I don't think I ever told anybody you have to vote for me. But in order to change the organization, it's a membership-driven organization. If you're not a voting member and you don't contribute to it in that regard, you're never going to change it. So typing in the comments mean, nasty things or upset comments like, you know, screw the NRA, the NRA sucks, isn't going to change how the organization runs. I'll tell you that right now. You're going to be very disappointed. Yeah, that, I mean, I think that's true. If you want to change it, you have to either – I think you said something – did you say – or, what, or did someone put those words in your mouth that, um, <laughs> you know, if you want to change it, you have to be in it. And and that's true. But it's also true that you can you could change it from the outside by not uh, by not funding it. And then maybe it's going to die. But Possibly. also also maybe other people unlike you will fund it. And maybe they're interested in other things, and maybe they don't care about machine guns. They don't care about suppressors. They don't care about modifying their ARs and things like that. And so those people will influence it. And this is a big uh, body that can actually lobby Congress and and do all those kinds of things, right? It's the biggest one. And I've also said on that that same thing that I'm a life member of the Second Amendment Foundation. You don't believe me. There you go. Mm-hmm. There, it is. there it is. Yeah, let's lock it up. Uh, okay, you took it off, right? Yeah, I just locked you on there so we could see it. There's the proof if you need it. <laughs> yeah, right. So, I, you know, right. I, I also said that it is perfectly fine to be a member of another gun rights organization. And in fact, you probably should be. I didn't say the NRA is the only one you should ever be a member of. Um, but that said, the NRA is the biggest. It is the one that... Uh, gets in front of Congress and lobbies, it's, you know, I think it's an organization that's worth fighting for to shape it into what we, the members, deserve. And that's one of the reasons I'm running for the board. Yeah, it's a, it's a little bit like guns, right? Like, I don't want just one gun. When people ask me how many guns I need, I'm like, I need all the guns. Right. I need yeah. every single one. So I think it's the same thing with these organizations. You can You can, first of all, choose not to support the NRA choose not to support any uh, pro-gun, uh, pro-Second Amendment organization, or you can choose to to support one or many or all of them. You know, whatever it is, you are 100% free to do whatever you want to do. Absolutely. You there, know, at, there's no question about it. Yeah. At the same time, I think that you have to realize that there is some power here, and the politicians do uh, respect this. And here's another thing that I think. You know, when I talk to, I, I, I meet a lot of guys that I think, wow, these guys are patriots. They understand the Second Amendment and all that. And I'm always like, you know what? You should run for office. And they go, yeah, I don't want to do that. Well, okay. So someone has to do it. Right. And then they catch all the crap that other people sling because they're unhappy about it. <laughs> yeah. You know, someone has to do this. And so there's someone out there that's running as politicians. And if you don't want to do it, if we think like politicians are slimy or whatever, and you choose not to run as a politician because you don't want to become slimy, then someone's doing that job and you have to have some kind of control on that person. Yeah. You know? Nope. That's, that's totally accurate. You know, um, I don't need to do this. Like I, I've got plenty of other things I could go do. I'm doing it because I think I genuinely can make an impact, a positive impact that would advance the interests of people who think like I do. Um, Mm -hmm. And I I don't think it's going to be easy. I don't think it's going to be overnight. I think it's going to take time. And anybody that's looking for a quick fix solution is going to be very disappointed. Yeah, Uh, and in case no no matter what it is. 
Right. And in case you guys um, don't know, there's one thing I want to ask you. But first, I want to say this. Um, you know, in case you guys don't know, I was actually there at the NRA when uh, you guys had the the, the uh, live discussion panel at the NRA. Mm -hmm. And um, and I think you were on the panel. I was. And there was there were some other people who represented folks that you were running against in the audience. And I think they went and reported that you were up there on the panel. I don't know if you you, you probably remember this. Because <laughs> someone came in there and told you that you could not campaign in there, right? Yeah. I, yeah. I remember that very vividly. Yeah. Um, so I was standing next to someone that when they realized, because they were trying to get me to support their guy, and <laughs> then they realized I had that button. <laughs> you know, the, the crowd yeah, button. The, I the had that crowd one. <laughs> yeah, I had that button on, and then they were like, wait a second, I think I understand, I see what's going on here. They left, and so I actually went to vote for you, and then I saw all the people coming <laughs> towards <laughs> towards the room where you where you guys were in, and I was like, oh, shit. So that dumpster fire. Uh, <laughs> let, let, me, let me tell you a little bit about that, because that's funny. So the annual meeting, I mentioned earlier, one – there's a one-year term that's voted on by members at the meeting. You have to be a member of the NRA 50 days prior to the meeting. That's the only qualification. So you could have been an NRA member for 51 days. You'd be good to go. So voting for that is Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Nobody's really there Thursday because the show doesn't start till Friday. So I didn't I, – I wasn't there on Thursday. I went shot sporting clays with some friends, You know, tried to see a little bit of Atlanta before I got down to brass tacks. Okay. Um, Friday rolls around, and I asked some friends. I, I put it out beforehand. I said, hey, if you would give me some time, because I, I had a general idea as to how this stuff was done, and it's really just manpower standing there, volume you know, volume being the thing, handing out flyers saying, hey, you go vote over there. Um, it'll take you two seconds. Here's the, you know, or just go vote for this person and sending them off. And, like, dude, people, people just go. Like, people, people don't even. So, um you know, Friday, I had some friends who came for a little bit. I had I had people who stood there from everywhere from five hours, like my boss Josh did on Saturday, to giving me 10 minutes of their time and everywhere in between. And the one thing I told all of the people who volunteered, uh, you know, friends, ARF commerce, uh, you know, my boss was that I don't care how long you give me. You, It's your time here in Atlanta. I want you guys to enjoy it. So if you want to give me 10 minutes, great, I'll take it. You want to give me an hour, awesome, I'll take it. Whatever you want to do. So anyway, I had a ragtag team there Friday uh, and myself. Um, and I also went around the show downstairs to, you know, give out stuff. And there were some people who helped me down there. Um, and I guess I must have done something right because uh, they went from having like three people handing out, four people handing out to Saturday. They had like 10 to 15 people standing there all day. They kept mm -hmm. making photocopies, coming in with stacks. They had current board members and they'll deny this, but I know I saw it and I know other people saw it. You could tell the board members by the, the pin they wear on their, their uh, badge that identifies them for internal security purposes. Mm -hmm. There were board members standing there as a board member campaigning for uh, Mr. Cushman. Which, you know, it's if you want to help your friend, fine. Take off your board member thing and do it as an individual, not as a board member. Yeah, so I think I'm, when they I think when um I think that they realized the power that could be mobilized through social media. Yeah. And they push back heavily against you. Otherwise you could have gone through. And unfortunately, like I didn't even get up on it in time just because I'm I'm doing a whole bunch of different things. And I think we should definitely try to change that um, the next time around. And the, and, the, and I'm going to go to uh, folks questions out there right now. I just want to remind everyone watching, click the thumbs up and uh, please share this uh, video with family and friends so that they know that we're doing this. OK, so money, the money question. What kind of money is in this being on the board, and Nothing. what other and what other responsibilities are included in this? Sure. So uh, the as far as the monetary compensation, there's no compensation for the position. The only thing that you are entitled to would be uh, reimbursements for like travel expenses to get to the board meeting and lodging. Okay. So Do you that, get like a private it. jet? You get like a G no. Oh no 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 a limo they, they, bodyguard. No, they they book you on like whatever the cheap stuff is. If you want oh. if you want more than that, then you know that's out of your own pocket. Um, you know, and and there are board members. I uh, I don't know if I'll be in the position to do it, so I'm not going to say I will. Uh, but there are board members like Tim Knight, who I have a lot of admiration for, who he pays out of pocket for everything because he doesn't think that that expense should be passed on the to the members, and he has the means to do it. Um, okay. 
So yeah, there's, so there, there are there are some we do have some good guys on the board that we can oh, rely on. That's what you're saying. Absolutely, and Tim, I, I would tell anybody who's watching this, you should certainly go check out Tim Knight. Um, he's one of the gentlemen who was responsible for the Colorado recall elections after they passed the magazine ban on thirty round mags and was okay. successful in kicking out. Is the he president from Knight's Armament or no? No, no. Okay. That's just okay. just his last name. Um, but he's he's somebody worth checking out. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so there's, I, you know, I'm not getting a salary out of it. I'm not getting anything like that. Yeah, so just for anyone who thinks that you're doing this, um, I mean, I, I think there's a little bit of power, but if you sit there and think that there's 76 dudes, you know what I mean? I just, I would like to see you in there so we have some idea of what the hell is going on. That's just the <laughs> beginning. You know I, what I mean? And then we can get, we can, like like you said, there's good guys in there. We keep them in there if, if they want to be in there or we figure out a way to stack the deck in our favor. And some of it, I mean, quite honestly, some of the stuff that I openly talk about now as a board member, I probably won't be able to openly talk about just because board members can't do that. Okay. Um, you know, and I'll find where that line is and I'll walk on the line because I yeah. want to be able to make as much information available to members so they can be informed as possible. But also, I have to understand that information, once it's out there, goes to anybody and everybody. Yeah. And, you know, there's also a very detrimental yeah. effect to that. Yeah, you're, you're a good lawyer, I see. Good, Nice caveat. <laughs> nice caveat. Okay, let's go. To, let's get to some questions before, uh, you know, people start uh, getting the pitchforks and uh, torches out here. So, okay, so Weston uh, Probst would like to know what books slash authors or podcasts does Adam read in his spare time? Wow. Spare time. Man, do you I have could, such a thing? Do you even know that, what that is? I, I wish at this point, like my spare time involves vegging out in front of the TV, which I honestly don't really like. Um, I'm trying to pick up books again. It was something when I was younger, I really enjoyed doing. Uh, my parents stopped taking me to baseball games because I started reading books at them <laughs> to, to give you an idea. Um, I honestly, I, I'm, I'm partway through, uh, his name's escaping me. Um, I think it's Rich Feldman's book. Um, uh, it, it's downstairs on my coffee table. I'm partway through that. I, I haven't finished that yet. Um, but other than that, I can't tell you the last book I like picked up for pleasure and I've actually managed to read recently. Yeah. Um, I listen to a lot of audiobooks, man. When I'm on the road or f flying, driving or something like that's that. That's a really good idea. Yeah. That's the I way to do it. Audio I, you books. Know, it's, there's something about it. Like, we, you know, I talked about this to my, my fiance, like the, an Amazon Kindle or something. Man, mm -hmm. I could... You know, I could totally put a lot of books on there if I, you know, found time to read them. Yeah. Um, but there's something about opening a book when I actually am able to do it and turning those pages that I really enjoy that I don't think an audio book or, you know, a Kindle will ever substitute. Absolutely not. No, nothing can substitute that. But I've just found, like, I, I also like reading like you do. And I found that that's the easiest way that I can balance out everything. Because my the rest of my time is spent making videos or editing videos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or planning on making videos or planning on editing the videos yeah. that we make. <laughs> And and, it's, and as far as crazy, yeah, I mean, and as far and I, I, I know because I, I watch, you know, that stuff going on for like John and stuff. I, I just mm -hmm. write the thing, I show up, film it, and I don't have the problem of what to do next. That's not my problem. Yeah. Um, oh, you don't know how to green screen? <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, honestly, I don't want to because that's something somebody in the future will be like, hey, well, I you know what? You're really good. That. Listen, you're really good at doing this crazy nonsense that you. I, I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> now we have subtitles. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you guys stepped up your game <laughs> uh, yeah the izzy found something and now i don't have to wave and, and no but that i think that worked pretty well though didn't it that did. work well for you guys okay. yeah yeah it mm -hmm. did um as far as podcasts i don't listen to them i'll be perfectly candid and like same with youtube i don't watch it um mm -hmm. I, it's not something that ever really caught my fancy and you know, I, I realize that now I create content as much as I don't want to admit in my head that I'm a content creator. Um, mm -hmm. it, and, you know, uh, it, like I create content, but I, I honestly don't have the time or, or sometimes the interest to watch it um, just because, like, I've got a bunch of other things going on. My day usually consists of, like, waking up, going to the gym, walking all the dogs. Uh, if I'm working from home, then it's like, you know, opening up the laptop and, and I work and I work and I work and I work. And then I'm mm -hmm. just fried or it's, you know, I'm driving to the office, I'm working and then I'm fried or, you know, driving to film stuff or it's just. Yeah. So what I, are your guilty pleasures then? I'm sure, I'm sure you're still having sex, but you don't have to give us details. I like eating. Eating okay, is good. Eating. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh. 
Um, it's good up until you start getting fat. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's why I'm going to the gym. I'm trying to avoid that. <laughs> I'm trying to find that balance. Um, yeah. Oh, man. Guilty pleasures. I don't know. Uh, I'm not you a big... You watch a lot of TV. What do you watch on TV? I don't watch a lot of TV. I okay, watch okay. like... A uh, half hour here, a half hour there. I still like South Park. I, st I still love South Park, okay. actually. Um, no, nothing wrong with that. South Park's one of my favorite shows. Um, I like some of the spy shows that are on TV, stuff like that. Those, those mm -hmm. have always been fun. But, um, you know, I like every once in a while, I'll kick back. I'll have a beer. I'll have uh, whiskey uh, or, you know, tequila. I do like tequila straight. I do like whiskey straight. I don't like mixing things, although margaritas are good. Um, cigars every once in a blue moon. But that's really it. Like, I'm not... Not big yeah. into a whole lot of things anymore. <laughs> okay, no, I understand. That's valid. Okay, let's uh, move on here. Scott Kimball wants to know, if elected to the board, what would your first order of business be? Seeing how things are done so I don't make an ass out of myself. Yeah. Uh, qu quite honestly, it, it, the, the first order of business will be kind of observing what things are done. Uh, won't Good mean answer. That, uh, it won't mean that I won't speak up. Uh, it won't mean that I won't participate but I'll certainly watch to see how things are done so I don't show up and people are like, well, we're definitely just not talking to that guy because then all this was for nothing, literally for naught. So mm -hmm. um, that that's going to be the first order of business to, to get a general understanding of how things are done, um, introduce myself to people, hopefully make acquaintances, hopefully develop some trust between other board members and myself, um, discuss some of the ideas I have, and uh, you know, hopefully continue to communicate with you, the members. Right. Okay. Very good. Uh, Shut up and play a guitar has more of like a statement. He says, uh, Adam is great at explaining ATF rules on TGC, the gun collective. Cool. So he, he enjoys that. That makes it worthwhile. So that, I mean, it, seriously, the, the best compliment I get from people and the only one I really care about is, hey, Adam, I learned something by watching your show. That was the entire purpose of it. And when people tell me that, I'm like, cool, what I'm doing is worth my time. Uh, because it was literally a, a result of a rant on Facebook of, I can't believe people are still in the age of Google, and it's now 2017 that people are still getting bad information about gun-related laws from their you know gun show, the gun store, the, the dude who won't just stop typing the wrong stuff on the forum. Like, how is this not corrected itself by now? Yeah, and I, think that, I think that that's what makes you a great asset to the uh, TGC, uh, just because I think lots of us turn to to what you put out there to understand what the hell's going on people are always sending me links they like you gotta look at this thing because it explains it and I'm like, oh, okay. that's, that's awesome yeah. and, and i i have the the one thing i have going for me in in that vein is i have esquire after my name so it adds credibility right off the bat um not to say that i'm, I'm bsing you guys because i'm not i am telling you how things are but I, I think that adds a little bit more credibility than uh, maybe somebody who isn't an attorney trying to explain, you know, complex laws and regulations because they aren't simple a lot of times. Right. Absolutely. Uh, Sergeant Hulk, as Big Toe wants to know, will the NRA be aggressively pushing concealed reciprocity? They have been. They've been lobbying for it for years. Um, it's currently sitting there. Uh, if you watch um, the interview with Chris Cox and James Yeager, which I think was just published earlier today, and I, I did sit down and watch it earlier. Um, one of the points he makes, and I, I thought it was a very interesting and, and honestly a valid point, is that you don't want to push for a bill if you know you don't have the votes, because the worst thing that could happen is that it gets introduced, put on the floor, and voted down. Good luck getting anybody to reverse their position on that in the future. All right. Um, so I think, you know, I, I think they probably are working very hard behind the scenes to lobby people to get them to, you know, either co-sponsor the bill or change position on it. I suspect if it were introduced, well, granted, Las Vegas probably wouldn't help, uh, but I suspect if it were introduced, it would likely pass the House given the current makeup of it. I suspect it'll stall or fail in the Senate. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I mean, you know what the, the question I would ask you here, I mean, mm -hmm. is this really a pipe dream? Is getting reciprocity really a pipe dream? And uh, the reason why I'm saying it, I want it. I want reciprocity. Sure. I want suppressors off the NFA. I want machine guns back. You know, right. I want nothing but the um, unfettered, unadulterated, <laughs> raw, right. you know, Second Amendment. The, the thing is, is that you've got um, a super majority, right, in Congress. You've got a, a Republican president in the White House and a guy who the NRA supported. Right. So not just, you know, 
they 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 put that moniker on him of being pro gun, mm -hmm. right? So you've got all of this going on, and we haven't gotten anything. And when we when we hear about things, they're like, oh, we're going to do that, and maybe in twenty eighteen. You know, I think they've tried to put up some things, and then obviously this this um, stuff that happened in Vegas became, I think, an excuse for them to take things off the table. But but they've got all the power; that everything's lined up. Why didn't they do anything there? The, well, I, that's <laughs> politics. It's always a very dangerous field to be in. Um, I I don't know. I the the Senate the the way the rules are. I don't believe the Senate has enough votes to just ram something through. So I think no matter what, if it goes to the Senate, it'll get stuck there. Uh, the House does have enough votes, and the president, I presume, if it hit his desk, would sign it, because after all, the NRA did support him, and he has said uh, that he is pro-gun. Now, I take that with a grain of salt, given his past tweets and his past, you know, just general <laughs> being a New York City Democrat. Um you know, and then again, I also look at his sons, and his sons are very pro-gun, and maybe it's very well possible they sat down and had the same conversation I did with my dad. Dad, listen, here's why you're wrong, and maybe he had an epiphany. I don't know. Um, I don't think national reciprocity is a pipe dream. I don't know if you will see it this congressional session. And then, then it will really become a question as to, does Congress's makeup change in this midterm election coming up? And... Uh, who the next president is. Um, if if Trump hangs in office and the Republicans still maintain a majority, it's very well possible you may see it again reintroduced next congressional session um, because remember, Congress is a two-year term. So every two years, every bill that's introduced dies and has to be reintroduced. Um, yeah, do you think do you think that Trump might be getting kicked out or he might No, 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 no. but I mean I mean as far as like, you know, if it mm -hmm. the next presidential election if it Oh, if the next time. Happen, okay. Yeah. Right. I think mm -hmm. I think we're probably closer to national reciprocity than a lot of people think, especially if you look at the number of states that over the last 10, 15, 20 years have instituted concealed carry laws where there didn't used to be. Um, I would almost liken it to some degree to uh, medical marijuana where you saw some states where it was legal but the majority it wasn't. And now you're looking at states and one by one, it's now over 25, I think it's closer to 30, states have said medical marijuana is okay. So I think it's only a matter of time before the feds look at it and go, well, we should probably do something about it. Now, again, maybe I'm wrong because this could go back to it being a state's rights issue. And, well, you know, our citizens here have to go through very strict training and, and whatnot to get a to get a license. And that guy can just, you know, as long as he says he's not a felon and he's not actually a felon, he lawfully can carry a concealed handgun. So, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I suspect that we're probably closer than one may think, though. Okay. All right, so let me try to go into some of the other things here. I noticed there's some comments people are making to the effect of uh, you must pay to voice your concern to Adam. I guess this is like fallout still. Really? From, where, yeah, where? I, I don't know. Can, can you tell me where the PayPal account is? I could really, that would be awesome. Yeah, I don't, I mean, this may be still fallout from the, uh, from the panel. Yeah, whatever. You know, I'm, so I'm, I, yeah, well, let's, so let's, uh, so while all of this stuff was going on, I think that people said that they were trying to comment to you guys and they couldn't comment. Do you know anything about that? Do you have any control over that? I, I was a panelist on the panel. That was, that was the extent of my involvement that evening. Yeah. Yeah. So what I could say to you guys is that um, even though Adam works with John, I think John was running, was anyone else helping John run the show? Um, I don't know if, uh, the editor was around or not, um, yeah. may, may have been, but I honestly wasn't paying that close attention to what was going on there. Yeah. We're going to probably, we'll, we'll try to get John on, like I said, and have him answer these things. I think you guys should give him, um, you know, some kind of room here because he took on something really, really big. And I think it was even big. I think he knew that he was taking on something big when he was doing it. But it got it became even bigger <laughs> than you guys probably expected it would be, right? Yeah, uh, that was. <laughs> I think it ended up at one point. I think there was like seventeen hundred people watching. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think we ever came close to anticipating that many people. Yes, and just to give you guys a point of reference, right now there's like a hundred and twenty something people watching this live, and you can see the comments on the side, like as they. As they come up, that yeah. chat, I remember clicking into that screen once or twice because I, I did have it up to see, you know, to see if there was an interesting question. And it was just like whizzing Strolling. past. And I'm like, yeah. okay, well, uh, you know, I'm closing out that window. I can't see anything. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, so I think people were really fired up and, you know, um, 
I don't know. I mean, we'll, we'll we'll see if that all winds up being a good thing or a bad thing in the end. But, you know, I think you guys should try to understand that. I don't know. Did John ever attempt anything this big? You What you guys did at the NRA went out live on Facebook. And I can't I don't know if it went out live on YouTube. I, I know it was on Facebook. I, th I think it was just Facebook. Yeah. And uh, that was that was pretty big because that was like a crap ton of people that showed up for that. Yeah, that was. Huge. I mean, there were six hundred some people standing in. The, there were people standing in the back of the room, all the way around the room. Yeah, and then there were hundreds of people sharing the live feed because mm -hmm. I know I shared it, and lots of people shared it. I think so, everybody you know, in that room. Yeah, I think you guys had to give some kind of like leeway to the fact that we're doing a lot of things here that we never did before. Maybe these things have been around and other people have been doing it, but in, so far as the gun community, we're always lagging behind a little bit and we're getting in here trying to do things. So I would try to encourage folks out there not to take it like too personally. I mean, obviously Adam is here and we're actually taking comments from you all and I'm reading even negative ones to him. Yeah, that's fine. So, and he's taking it. So there we go. And we're going to try to, um, you know, we'll try to cover that. I'll see if anyone else has a... Uh, Anyone else has a thing here? Um, there was there was one I saw earlier. Let okay. Me see, if, see if I can find it here because I, I thought it was a good. Uh, I don't I don't remember who asked it. Uh, I rem I remember the question though. Um, okay. And, and I'm sorry because I'm probably not going to give you credit. So if you if you see it. Uh, yeah. What was the question? The the question was, what do you think about the two A rally that's supposed to be coming up? Yes. That okay. Nationwide? That's. Yeah, let's cover that. Yeah, so that, that's an interesting topic because that's actually something John and I have we talked about actually earlier today uh, when I was filming stuff over there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's I, I got a lot of people tagging me in that. John's got a lot of people tagging him in it. I'm getting people emailing me. You know, interesting concept. You're doing it on a Sunday. Yeah, who's gonna be who's gonna be there? Does anybody that we're and, trying to get to hear our voice? Right, and that's you know I I see the other side and, and I'll get to this in a second. So here in Pennsylvania, we hold a Firearms Owners Against Crime actually started it, um, and they are the premier gun rights lobby group for Pennsylvanians in Pennsylvania. So if you're here in PA, you should probably become a member of them. Um, I'm a life member of that as well. Um, they hold a rally every year at the state capitol where they have speakers and people rally on the steps or in the rotunda, and then they go around all the offices and lobby the people that are supposed to be representing us. They bring up issues. They talk to them about stuff. They give them information, facts, trade, you know, whatever. How are you going to do that on a Sunday? That's that's a problem. And I, while it's great that maybe Sunday people are like, well, I don't have to work. I can totally show up. That, that's all well and good. But you standing outside the doors without talking to the people that represent you? Yeah. And uh, I think know, it, I don't know if they're bag. doing it on Sunday because it's Guy Fa uh, like Guy Fox. I don't know how much that means anything here in America. Um, but I don't know if that has anything to do with it because of uh, November 5th. And, um, you know, it's a weird thing. Maybe they're hoping that the news media shows up and then it, and then it somehow winds up in the news and these guys see it. I think the problem with that is we cannot trust the news media. They don't. Uh, for example, if you look at like um, I know that there's a um, there's some stuff being shared right now with um, the governor of Ohio. And I'm trying to remember his name right now. Kasich. Kasich. Yeah. Is he still governor? Um, I think so. Uh, but, you know, Kasich, I think, was on CBS or something like that. And he's supposed to be a Republican, but he's talking about gun control and all, all these kinds of things, right? Well, there and, there were Republicans in the House. My, my yeah. representative was one of them who co-sponsored the bill on banning some of that yeah. stuff. There were three of them here in Florida. The thing is, is that the news media only wants to talk to people like that who don't really understand like what they're talking about, what they're talking about banning or guns or how we feel about those things. They just want to talk to people that are going to push forward their narrative, even if it's Republicans. They've been doing that from the time that um, that Trump actually got elected. They've been hiring experts who are Republicans and all that kind of stuff. But what they do is they come on TV and say how horrible Trump is or this thing or that thing. So I don't know if it's even worth spending the time to try to get the media to do things. But I, but also I'm not knocking people and, and I'm not telling people don't, if you want to go to your state capitals, go. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You have the right to do that. Yesterday we were sharing the links to the Facebook pages, trying to organize it and you know, it's yeah, absolutely I, a way to do things. 
I, I absolutely would not tell people not to go do it. Not saying that at all. Just saying that you're missing part of the benefit of holding it at the Capitol is that you can go in theoretically after the fact and then go talk to the people that represent you face to face. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's missing from this equation. Now, I don't know. Again, you pointed out it's Guy Fawkes Day, so maybe there's some kind of, supposed to be some kind of, um, uh, you know, something representative about choosing that particular date. Uh, and that's fine. Um, you know, symbolism is, is alive and well, and it's a good thing. Uh, but to your point about the media, controlling the narrative is extremely important. So if you can hire people that will allow you to continue doing that, you can keep spreading information that might not uh, be 100% accurate. And if the people treat you as the source of information and don't bother to investigate it, ask questions, it, uh, you know, question it, anything like that, then they're just going to accept it as fact. Like, how many of you who are watching now go to Google and type something in, and the first thing Google spits out, you're like, okay, that's true, um, you know, where it pulls up somebody's biography or, yeah. you know, about a date, and you're like, oh, Google says it must be right. Yeah, how well, many how, many people, how many people listen to Yankee Marshall and then um, just believe what you guys were saying but didn't actually look to see what you were saying? I have no idea. It, I mean, yeah. pick, it, it pick, any, pick yeah. anything and, you know, put it in that exact equation, and you're going to get the same result. Most people, myself included, don't go and check information uh, like that. They just accept it. Well, Google's reliable. You know, this person's reliable. They're a syndicated news network. They might be reliable, you know, and, and that's a huge problem. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let me go through a few more things here. Um, uh, someone says, McTag says, I think they were trying to block trolls on the comments. Uh, it, I'm pretty sure that was getting crazy. And if you actually look at that video, you could see that it was just insane. And there's no way that anyone could keep up with everything that was going on. Um, uh, someone, I think intro zoo 76 says, I like how this chat doesn't get flooded and you can actually read people's comments. <laughs> I like that uh, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that, I think that's a good thing. You know, I think if we're really going to have a conversation and it's not just like uh, me talking to myself or just Adam and I talking, it's a good thing that there are people there, but if it gets really crazy and there's just tons of comments going up there, then it makes it difficult for me to help you guys get your, your voice heard. So Joe Nutson says, um, well, actually, okay, let's, let's do Matthew uh, Mahler first. He says, Yankee and everyone needs to break back bread. So what do you think about that? Um, I've never met him. Never had an interaction with him. I, yeah. I, don't have, I, don't ha I have no issue either way. You know, if, if he yeah. doesn't like me, fine. Okay, sorry. Can't please everyone. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I've never, I didn't make a video response to his video. I didn't, I, I showed up on the panel. I said some things. Some people apparently took issue with that, and that was it. Yeah. Um, and I think, like, I don't see where Yankee Marshall tried to do a panel. And I'm not trying to beat him up. I think Yankee Marshall made some good points. You know, and, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think where you try to, like, tear down other people who are doing something is where you go wrong. I know that we don't all get along and there's clicks and all this kind of stuff, but we, we can also just try to do our own thing. You know, you, other people don't have to let you play with their ball or play in, the, in, their, in their ballpark or whatever it is, you know. So... Um, so far as breaking bread, I, I, I don't know if the ship has sailed on that one. <laughs> so some for some people, it might have, to be honest with you, right? Because some people, I, I think, are have, I, have I honestly, taken feelings. After that panel, I didn't talk to anybody about it. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. Okay, I got other things to go do now. Yeah. Joe I, Nutson says, he uh, I wasn't happy, but I apologize to Adam, and I do support him. Well, thank so, you. Um, yeah. Sorry you weren't happy. I don't know what you weren't happy about but uh, yeah. I think some folks just got mad you know someone said hey get mad about this and they got mad and they didn't necessarily look at it and then also like let's say if someone tells you something uh, you, you know I don't know if you've done any criminal things but you're, you're a lawyer you know that you can easily set people up to either hate someone or like someone so if someone sets you up and they're like these guys are horrible and even then you go look at it mm -hmm. You know, you've already got that prejudice in your mind. Yep. You know, so unless you're just a really super rational person and you look at it and you take it for what it is, it may it may throw you off. And I think at the end, like I looked at uh, what happened with you guys and I don't, you know, I think there were there were a couple of things in there that I don't agree with, but I don't see what was so wrong. If you're going to have a discussion, there's going to be something that you hear that you don't agree with. Absolutely. That's that's the purpose of a discussion. 
Yeah. Um, you know, I, you, you, if you sat around a table with everybody who said the same thing and you all agreed, what, what did you accomplish? You posted a meme on Facebook and got a hundred likes. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So little lioness zero zero one says California, New Jersey, and New York will never agree to national carry. They will have to be forced but then it will become a state's rights issue. What do you, what do you think about that? So that's an interesting point. Um, the, the way the law is written, uh, I don't remember if it's in both versions of the bill or just one, so forgive me on that. Um, but the way the law is written, it actually does have a provision for an individual who is arrested, detained, what have you. If they were carrying lawfully in the manner that the federal proposed federal law uh, provides for, it would give them the ability to sue the state uh, or the department or whatever and recover attorney's fees, which is huge because, um, you know, that that's how the guy suing gets somebody to actually sue for him a lot of times. Um, so it would the idea being essentially that if you violate the law by uh, detaining people or arresting them and they're actually carrying lawfully, um, then we're going to punish you and we're going to punish you financially. And eventually your taxpayers are going to theoretically get sick and tired of paying for your transgressions and they're going to let you know about it. That being the, the idea behind it. But at the very least, that individual gets compensated financially for it. And they get to do it in federal court as opposed to state court so they don't have to worry about the, the local people being, yeah, we don't really care. We agreed that they arrested you. That's all great. Um, muted. Yeah, so I think there are some people asking, can the Supreme Court do something about this? Well, I mean... Supreme Court doing about... Uh, like about reciprocity. Can they, you know, can they like directly affect these things or can they just hear things and then interpret what they think it is and be the ultimate interpreters of that? How does that work? So the, the Supreme Court's the ultimate arbiter on whether a law is constitutional or not. Um, mm -hmm. So they, they wouldn't be able to necessarily hear... They, they wouldn't be able to just say, hey, we're going we're gonna to write a decision here that says, you know... The, you can't carry in other states or you can carry in other states. Not, not the way it works. So like the where you're seeing this, um, I'll use like a real life example here. Maybe that'll help. Uh, the Washington, D.C., where they had the good cause requirement um, for getting a uh, carry permit down in the District of Columbia. So you, you either needed to show that your life was uh, like immediately threatened or that you carried high value stuff for your, your duties. And they pretty much like denied everybody. It was just... It was almost impossible. It was like a de facto ban. And the the um, got appealed up to the Circuit Court of Appeals. District Court heard it, uh, got appealed up to the Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Circuit Court of Appeals said, yeah, no, this is not okay. Uh, you know, the Second Amendment, um, our interpretation of the Second Amendment, it, it appears that they're part of the core of the Second Amendment here is not only defense in the home, but defense outside of the home. And the way you're implementing this law, it prevents the majority of people from being able to exercise that core principle. And therefore, this law is unconstitutional. Okay. So the D.C. Uh, said, yeah, we don't we don't like we don't want people carrying guns. We don't like this. Um, so they went and they asked for the circuit court to rehear it on bonk, meaning as a whole. So uh, a panel of three judges on bonk would be however many judges sit on the actual court, uh, you know. Uh, like 12 or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. In this context, it didn't go to the Supreme Court. It wasn't appealed to the Supreme Court. They said, we're going to leave it alone. And the reason I think they said they're they going to leave it alone is because had they appealed and the Supreme Court said, we're going to hear it, because uh, that's the first step. Supreme Court has to say that they want to hear it. If right, because I know they've been saying there's a bunch of things they don't want to hear, right? Mm -hmm. we've, we've been and, dealing with some of that. Yeah, and some of that goes to what they like to do is allow an issue to percolate up between the different circuit courts. So they get the first circuit saying, yeah, that's good. Third circuit saying, no, it's not. And they get some dissension and then they go, okay, we got to weigh in and make it uniform across the land. So mm -hmm. um, in this case, it, you know, had that gone up to the Supreme Court, it very well is possible if they chose to hear it and they chose to rule the same way the court did below, that now all these good cause provisions in uh, like New York and in New Jersey would all be just gone, done. Mm -hmm. um, and it's possible the District of Columbia said, we don't want to risk that for those other states. Uh, possible. I don't know. Um, a lot, there's a lot that goes into potentially appealing something to the Supreme Court, including the makeup of the court, uh, other case law. There, there's a lot that goes into yeah. it before this you This is a that really leap. complicated chess game. That's why it always like, it's a little it takes weird. It a me. lot of planning. Um, yeah. 
you know, like everybody thinks, oh, Rosa Parks is such a hero. Uh, Rosa Parks didn't just accidentally walk onto the bus one day and sit down. That was very carefully calculated and planned. Um, you know, like there, there's a when, when people are talking about getting stuff to the Supreme Court intentionally, there's a lot of planning ahead for that. It just doesn't just happen. Um, yeah, and it has to be sometimes even the right people. There might be several people out there that are potential, but they're like, mm, I think this one might be a good one. This person. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Yep. Yeah, um, they, like this person makes a good poster child or whatever it is, you know, for the cause. Well, like uh, Heller in D.C., um, he was – there were a bunch of plaintiffs in that one, uh, the original Heller case, and they were told don't go uh, – I think it was don't go – apply for the permit or whatever and dick heller was like yeah i'm going to do it anyway and he was he was the only one who was able to sue because he did that because he had standing to do it they they everyone else got kicked out of the case he right was the only yeah. one that could go forward with it yeah i think um i think i actually met him at one of the either shot show or nra show at some point yeah i think he goes so, to a lot of those uh events yeah. yeah i think i met him at the dinner okay let me hit up some more questions here um, so, so we've got questions. Can anyone run or just members? So what do you have to be in order? Let's, you know, I think that's a good thing. Like, um, we, we need more than one guy, right? We established that we need more than just you in there. So for Absolutely. folks who are listening, like, what do you have to do in order to qualify to run for the board? Let's like do the step-by-step -step process on that. Sure. So the only requirement that I'm aware of based on my, my reading of the bylaws is that you have to be a life member. Okay. Or, or better. Um, I don't know if that, and this would be a question for the secretary's office. I don't know if that would mean you just have to be a voting member or a life member. Um, I suspect life, not just voting, uh, because voting members are life or better or annual members of the past five consecutive years. So I could see them having an issue of you were a member for five consecutive years. You somehow, you know, you got elected to the board and then you let your membership lapse. Like I could see that being a problem. <laughs> yes. Yeah. They, and they, and there are people who would use all those different things, but if you're a life member, yep. so even if you've had lapses and things like that, if you just go and become a life member, you're good. Yeah. That's, that's my understanding. That's the only qualification. Now the process of getting on the ballot is entirely separate from that. Remember that's either by petition or by the nominating committee. So if you don't clear either of those hurdles, you're not getting to even to the onto the ballot part. Okay, and the nominating committee, that's gonna be the most difficult way to go, right? Yeah, well, I, I guess it depends on your definition of difficulty. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, co collecting a whole bunch of signatures. So you would think anyway, the NRA yeah. being a national organization, 5 million members, 2.2 voting, 2.2 million voting members, that's 600 some signatures, like cakewalk, right? No. Not even close. And then making sure that the stuff was filled out correctly, even more of a pain. Like, oh, you know, uh, that's not the name you have on file with NRA. That's huge. Like, look at your membership card or your, your magazine label. Like, that's what NRA has. So if, you know. If, oh, so if an initial is off or the name. Uh, yeah, so if, if right. everybody calls you Hank and your name is Tony and your, your name there is Tony on file and you put Hank on the petition, they'd be like, nope, doesn't count because that's not what they have in their records. So mm -hmm. um, the, okay. the nominating committee isn't, isn't easy either. They get a whole bunch of applications and they have to narrow it down. Um, they, were, they nominated more people than usual because they suspected, I, I'm guessing, that there would be less petition candidates due to the bylaw change and the increase of signatures needed. Okay, um, so you chose to go um, the petition route instead of trying to go through the nominating committee, right? That's, right. Yep, that's it's, easy. It's more guaranteed if you get the number of signatures. It also shows a, a connection to the members. Like, I'm asking you for my vote. I should at least prove myself to you to get onto the ballot before I come out and say, hey, you know, vote for me. Well, why should I vote for you? You know, it's a question I was asked here earlier, and it's a, a very legitimate question. Okay. Um, well, the nominating committee nominated me. Okay, and um, so I think I think there is a, a connection between somebody who runs by petition and the members that is more organic and more real because it's grassroots to a large degree. Like I had to go out, I had to get people to sign petitions for me. I had people who were kind enough to take time out of their busy lives to circulate petitions for me. Um, you know, I had to do all that in order to even get on the ballot. Mm -hmm. So now, and who is it that had, like, what's the qualifications of the person who has to um, sign the petition in order for you to get on the ballot? 
So they have to be life life members or annual members of the past five consecutive years. They have to be oh. a voting member. Okay. So, so yeah, it's not just like you just signed up for the NRA now and you could sign this. Nope. So unlike the annual meeting, that one year board seat where it's that those fifty days uh, prior to the meeting where you can vote at the annual meeting mm-hmm. for signing petitions, be it for bylaw changes, for board of directors, and to vote, you have to be an annual member of the past five consecutive years or a life member or yeah. better. So here's why I want to stop us here for a second, because sure. I think here's where the point that you were trying to make that people shouldn't just abandon this whole thing becomes valid. Because if you are, if you have been a member of the NRA consecutively, and then now you go, well, screw that, okay, and then you skip out on a year, and then next year you realize, you know what, maybe we need to try to get into this thing, you're, you're at reset, right? Oh, absolutely. Unless unless you want to pony up for a life membership. And even on sale, the cheapest I've seen them on sale in three years has been 500 bucks. Right. So, you know, that's... Oh, where, oh, where, when it's on sale and it's 500 bucks, where is that? <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, I mean... Uh, I, is that I've at the, on, like, the annual meeting? I've seen it on like Midway USA and um, ARFCOM has it on there a lot of times okay. uh, when it happens. Um, the The one thing that struck me. We should me share as, that the next time that happens and let sure. folks know out there because this is obviously like something that you could do if you if you do this. I know there's going to be people who say, well, I'm not giving them my money, but this is a, an important thing here. They've they've created this structure that if you say now you're not going to do it and you skip out and then you want to come back and try to do it a year or two years from now, it's going to be more difficult because now you got to start that all over again. Right. And, and one of the things that um, was really fascinating and, and incredibly humbling was and it's still happening, is that last year when I started running, people said would send me messages and emails and stuff, and, and, and some people I, I met personally, I joined as a life member just to vote for you. Mm-hmm. Like, dude, you just spent how much money just to vote for me? Uh, thank you, number one. That's incredibly humbling, because I guess I'm saying something that you agree with, but wow. Um, and, and that was that was, you know, just it was unbelievable. At Shot Show, I was talking to uh, somebody from Recoil who was going to interview me. We were going to do something live on Instagram, and we ended up chatting for too long. But there was a, a gentleman standing there, and I saw him, and um, he kind of kept looking at me. And I, you know, I just finished telling that same story. People were joining, and he interrupted and said, "Hey, I just wanted to say hi to you. I'm one of those people that joined as a life member just to nice. vote for you." Yeah, yeah. And, and the guy from Recoil looked at me and was like, "Not that I didn't believe you, but now there's somebody standing here telling you that." Um, and and that's just, that's really been incredible. Yeah. Awesome. So, um, I think, uh, we've got people that want to know, I don't know if we finished like what you need to do. Let's finish that first. Okay. So you need to get the signatures, right? So now you got the signatures. Now, what do you have to do in order to, to, um, actually get on the board? So then now it's just, you know, ballots get mailed out in the February issue of the NRA magazine to which you're subscribed. If you're one of those people that's uh, subscribed to the digital one, they mail them out of about a month after that. Um, if you don't get one by like mid February, you got to call NRA membership services if you're actually a voting member and say, "Hey, I didn't yeah. get one. Send me one." Yeah, I always they always get my money. I don't always get my magazine. <laughs> yeah, well, it, that, the, the magazine. February the February issue is the one that if you care about the board of directors election, that's yeah. the one you want. Okay, um, or and, you can sign up and get the digital. Right, As and an you email. should get okay. a ballot about a month later. But you want you want to make sure you get that, um, and it is paper only. You got to make sure you sign the envelope, uh, otherwise it doesn't count. Um, so the strategy for voting is actually pretty simple. the The ballot will come and it'll tell you you can vote for up to twenty five people because that's how many seats are up for election usually, unless somebody died or stepped down or something like that. Uh, so we'll say twenty five because that's what it should be. Um, and people go, oh, I can vote for twenty five people. So they vote for like the one dude they really want to make, and they go, oh, I know this guy and this guy, and you know, then they and next thing they know, have 25. Well, mm-hmm. it's think of it like almost like a, like a, like a better description, like a popularity contest. It goes mm-hmm. by who gets the most votes. So if, if everybody votes for 25, but you really want that one person on the board, you take away from their chances by voting for the other 24. Oh, okay. So, the strategy, so I didn't know that. Or oh, even if you vote for three people, you've well, just made it a one in three. Well, but three three is better. So the oh, okay. idea is that you vote for only the people you want to see on there. So like the movie star probably doesn't need your vote. And you should also be asking, are they showing up to meetings? Are they doing anything? You know, like it shouldn't just be like, oh, I recognize the name. Cool. Yeah, um, I mean, uh, we got a, we got one of the questions that we've get that we're getting in here is does Tom Selleck and Carl Malone do they show up to meetings? Carl Malone is not on the 
board anymore. I yeah, I don't know. With okay, Tom Selleck. Um, I think and, we've got. Um, I, I, if you stay tuned, I have some very good information uh, that I'll be releasing shortly okay. as to who's showing up to meetings and who's not. Yeah. Um, okay. Cool. I have that. Uh, so it, the idea is, it's called bullet voting. Essentially, you vote for the only the people you want to see that to ultimately end up there. So if it's one person, if it's three people, you know, you just vote for them, and that's it. And you, you send off okay. your ballot. Um, you know, so don't vote for 25 is really what I'm getting at. Here. Yeah, yeah, that's really important. Um, <laughs> I think that's just like ridiculous. Okay, so and then so once you vote, they tally up the votes, and that's how we figure it out. But if if so, if people went in there and chose 25 people, they've really watered it down because the NRA is themselves going to choose whoever is the most popular out of those, right? It's going to be whoever is basically whoever finishes 26 is is first loser oh really okay. is the best way to put it you know for, for first one to not get on get on the ballot and then if you don't so last year i was shy about six thousand votes in the mail-in ballot um your name is automatically put onto the ballot for the nra annual meeting and then you you know obviously make the decision am i going to campaign at the meeting like i did last year or you just you do not care um or not want to pursue it um so nra will select one of their candidates from the nominating committee to go on out, uh, and, and they will, they look like they did this past year, they will hand out stuff for their candidate, they will push people in there to vote for them, and if they get a challenger, then, you know, that goes from there. Oh, okay. All right, and then you're, so you will be doing that at this upcoming meeting in Dallas, <laughs> I believe? Well, I don't we're know. we're not talking if, about that if, yet, okay. If I get elected by the mail-in ballot, I don't have to worry about it. Oh, that. I see. If I don't get, if I don't get elected by the mail-in ballot, Got to give it some thought. Um, okay. It was a lot of work. Um, not to say I won't do it, but it's something that I haven't made a final determination on as of yet. Okay, cool. Now, so one of the questions I wanted to go to, um, folks want to know, why does the VP of the NRA never change? Uh, I told you earlier, board elects them. Oh, okay. So there, there's your answer. The, the board, the board continues to vote for the same executive vice so president. So that's like a that's like a Putin kind of thing, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if yeah. I go that far, but uh, it, it, it feels probably, like it to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I I don't know what control Wayne exerts over board members or not. I'm sure that they probably all have pretty good relationships with him, or at least some of the older ones do, because they've been there a while. He's been there a while. They probably have a relationship. Um, and I, I can't, I can't fathom what goes on in, in people's heads. I don't know. I'm not privy to it. Um, mm -hmm. But I would imagine that maybe that might cloud some judgment on, on people of not wanting to be perceived as, you know, stabbing a friend in the back or something like that. But I, I don't know. I, yeah. And I don't claim to know. I'm not saying that's what happens. So what kind of power does the president have? I mean, a lot of people are asking, you know, for example, you know, you've got Pete Brownell. He's the president now. Does he or does he not have power? Because it seems like he really doesn't have that much. Well, it's a, it depends what you mean by power, number one. Um, and it, it also depends as, well, I mean, I guess that's really the biggest thing as to, as to what you mean power is. I think most people know Wayne because he's the he's been the face of the organization. And this is one thing that um, I, I guess isn't really uh, spelled out so much is that um, the executive vice president doesn't have to be the face of the organization. It just, in this instance, happens to be the case. You know, there there is a giant marketing company, which is a whole separate can of worms. Um, but you could hire a spokesperson. There's no need that. There's nothing that says that you know the executive vice president is the guy who has to go on national TV or hold the press conference or anything like that. Um, but as far as what the president does, um, they you know any of the meetings at the association they preside over those. Um, they sit on. Uh, you know, committees, they, they do, they appoint, uh, they appoint standing committees. They, and you know, they do other duties that a president of an organization does. So part of that's running the day to day stuff. Um, it's, you know, it, it's, it, it's not, um, not a dictatorship. Maybe that's a better way to put it. You know, okay. they, don't, they don't get to just call all the shots. Okay. Yeah. I think a lot of us are now paying attention to this with, with everything that's going on. So we're trying to see what's going there. And then um, I think there's a lot of people that are asking this question. What do you think about the NRA getting into for-profit ventures like Carry Guard, you know, where they kicked out the USCCA from the, sure. the last meeting? What do you think about that kind of stuff? 
Well, NRA has got to make money to spend money, right? Um, I I think NRA has to generate income. There's no, there's no question about it because membership dues aren't going to pay uh, to you know get a president elected every election cycle. It's just it's the reality of it. However, that being said, um, carry guard is not something that uh, I'm a fan of. Um, it, you have two components. You have the, the insurance component and you have the training component. And mm -hmm. it seems if you ask a number of board members uh, as to the, the fruition of it, um, there's a lot of cloudiness behind that. And the problem with it is is that I don't think there was a lot of oversight into it. And you pissed off a whole slew of people when you did it. You pissed off the people who are NRA certified trainers, the people that you should have been talking to is to like, hey, we're thinking about doing this thing. Um, can you give us some feedback on it? How would you feel about being a part of it? What can we do to make it better and help you as an NRA instructor instruct people in, in safety and things like that? And then you have the like uh, part where we're just going to alienate every other company that had been uh, in the business of self-defense insurance um, mm -hmm. on like, okay, you know, by the way, get out. Um, and that's you know, not, not good for anybody, really. Yeah. And, um, you know, yeah, I think that, um, I don't know, man, we, we could get, we can get really lost in that. Let me, <laughs> let me go on to some other things here. Okay. So, um, what do you think? Obviously you're not in the NRA, you know, you're not on the board or anything like that, but you're very interested in it. What do you think they're doing to get more diverse quote unquote? When we do you see think they're doing anything there or when we say diverse, what do we mean by diverse? Yeah. I mean, I, you know, if, in if my talking, mind, if we're talking about, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, in my mind, I think that's not just like, I'm not just talking about racially diverse. You know, I think being diverse is and what's more important to me is people. I, I would like to see some people who represent the current gun culture. Right, because I think that's what's misrepresented the most. I think if uh, Wayne Lapierre understood that, he wouldn't go on TV and keep reiterating that the NRA is one supporting uh, the ban on machine guns, and then two does not think that people should be able to modify their rifles. So to me, diversity would be that as well. I'm not saying, of course, I think diversity would be having you know maybe people of color, you know, some more women up in there. But I, but I'm not talking about like the folks who they hired to you know to be uh pr representatives okay yeah no i just wanted to get an idea as to as to what we were talking about here so yeah. um i i don't know what that i have a visitor here hey buddy um, <laughs> that's a cute I, dog yeah <laughs> he's a yeah he's, yeah. A, he's a handful he uh, we he's got enough he's like seriously dude you've been talking yeah. to someone over here for a while <laughs> yeah we got him in check June. this out he, okay. had, he had been tied to a fence in philadelphia so he came from the uh the local spca uh -huh. he's okay. been a a great pup and he wants yeah. my hot chocolate anyway um so as far as the diversity hey why don't we get down real quick um <laughs> as far as the diversity aspect i don't know i mean i think one of the things that if we look at the nra and its rhetoric as of late it's been in a manner that would be very uh, off-putting to individuals who are not part of that i i don't even want to say core base but to some degree that core base of like the red-blooded, uh, you know, Midwestern American, uh, you know, if you look at the stuff they've been doing, it alienates the guy who may be, um, you know, f liberal on every other policy, but it's like, guns are great. I think guns should be defended to, the, you know, like uh, all that stuff is off-putting to them. I, I think by, mm -hmm. by virtue, uh, the way we see politics today anyway, not so true in years past because you have blue dog Democrats, um, Politicians who are Republican, for the most part, by and large, tend to be more supportive of pro-gun stuff than Democrats. So I right. think as a result, you see the NRA pushing more and more towards Republicans and alienating anybody who may not be a Republican in that process, but may be a very pro-gun individual. Yeah. Um, but I then it just becomes like a meme that some of these Republicans are putting up because they they kind of realize like, well, OK, to play the game, I have to be pro-gun. But they don't really understand what the hell they're talking about. Well, and I think that's also part of the problem is that we don't have a very good education system when it comes to firearms. And this is part of what I've been saying since I've been you know, running for this position since last year has been that, um, you know, we teach kids in school. We, we used to teach kids in school gun safety, right? 
that you everybody mm -hmm. had a basic understanding of what a firearm was, how it worked, and how to be safe around it. We don't do that anymore. But we teach kids about sex. We teach kids about drugs. We teach kids how to drive cars because we as a society understand that like people are going to find this stuff, whether we as the adults want them to or not, and they're going to use them. They're going to have sex. They're going to do drugs. They're going to drive cars. So and they're also well going to come into contact with guns. Right. And mm -hmm. we might as well give them the tools to do all that stuff safely or have the knowledge set of like, okay, that thing's bad. Don't touch that. And like, oh, I shouldn't do this. Um, probably shouldn't drive that car at 100 miles an hour in the left lane going the wrong side on the highway. Um, but we don't do that anymore with guns because there's some taboo about it that guns are just inherently evil. And that creates a huge problem because while I may have may not have guns in my house, we'll say as an example, but you do. And let's say my kid plays with your kid and they stumble across the gun. Well, my kid has no idea what the hell that is. And if your kid is being irresponsible that day, uh, you know, oh, what's this? And, you know, next thing you know, yeah. boom, somebody's dead on the floor. Um, yeah. But it also, goes to, mm -hmm. it, it also goes to it also goes to a more general understanding of like how things work and what things are. So if we taught some of that stuff, it would be more socially acceptable. And, and this is really what I'm, I'm driving at here. Right? It's like it's a play like right out of the left's playbook. If you if you can teach children that things are okay, they'll grow up knowing they're okay. So if you really want to effectuate change, it's not the, the meme you're posting on Facebook to the adult that's going to do it. It's going to be educating the youth of the next generation to, to see that these things are fine. There's a reason behind them. There's a purpose behind them. They can be used safely. And this is how they function. And they'll grow up going, oh, you know, it's not such a terrible thing. Like, what, what was grandpa talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think also one of the things we need to do, so, for example, because a lot of, let's say it's a lot of Republicans that are doing it right now, I'm going to assume that Democrats just don't go out there and try to seek the support from the NRA. I think some of them do, like you said, there's some blue dogs. But before the NRA just goes out there and, and helps them or whatever it is, gives them our money and helps support them, I think one of the things they should try to do is have like a big brother program or something like that where – Maybe they're, you know, you've got this guy who's saying he's pro-gun. You, you hook him up with an actual gun guy. They go shoot and do some of these things. And even if he's not super into it and doesn't go out there and buy like 10 AR-15s, he's, he's done some of this and then has contact with this guy. So before he goes out there and start talking about things, he can reach out to this person almost like as a consultant or something like that. Well, that, that goes to being responsible, and, and politicians, to a large degree, don't seem to care. I will say this. The ASA was very good at doing just that, and I will give them a lot of props. I, I have some issues with some of the other things that they have done as far as the way they pitch stuff, but the one thing that they absolutely did correctly was they said, look, you know. Now, what's, what is the ASA? The American Silencer uh, Suppressor Association. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, because I call them yeah. silencers. But they, they, they go. They, they call the congressmen uh, you know, in, in, at the state and federal level, and they say, look, this is a silencer, right? This is what you think it does. This is what it actually does. Now let's go shoot it. And they would go to the range and shoot it. And they would put all these myths and stuff to, you know, wow, that's not as quiet as Hollywood made it seem. And all of a sudden, like this whole evil uh, you know, perception of this device that's nothing more than a muffler mm -hmm. um, – has now shifted because you had that education. And I think what you just said is an excellent point and an awesome way to do it is that, look, and, and you're not going to get everybody to do it. This is the biggest thing with yeah. the educational aspect. The person has to be willing to at least learn. Um, doesn't mean they have to agree at the end, but they have to at least have an open mind as to, look, I may not know everything. Why don't you show me? Um, because if they don't have the open mind, like you're not taking Diane Feinstein anywhere. She's just going to play your role, right? <laughs> yeah. But you take, you take the person on in the middle, you take the person who might be leaning towards the other way and you say, Hey, come with me. And I, I think that's a really excellent point. And I think that's something that we need. We as gun owners really have a responsibility to do with our, our friends, family and neighbors for that matter as to like identify the ones that are just leaning towards the other way or are in that center and show them that this is what this is. This is how it works. This is why it should be protected. And we as gun owners have to change that perception. And I know it's a lot of work, but it's something that I found throughout my life as a gun owner that does work and it does change opinions. And people who used to have a negative opinion or a neutral one either walk away with a positive one or you know that maybe that same neutral one or less of a negative one. But the more people you do that with versus posting the meme on Facebook screaming how everything's an infringement on your gun rights, the better chance you have of getting to that 
less of an infringement than you do by posting that meme. Yeah. It's the sad truth. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have to try to encourage people without a doubt um, to come along. And I think that, you know, you yes, you can force people to do stuff or you could try, but that's not guaranteed that that's going to work, that we could force everyone to do it. And, and it's uh, to me, it's the last thing I want to see happen because that's not going to be fun. You know, I think there are ways. I remember um, I had a friend of mine that um, actually the boyfriend and girlfriend, both of them were paramedics. And um, she, the, the girl, she got into this thing where um, downstairs from, from where she lives was a pharmacy. And these guys try to rob the pharmacy. It was in New Jersey. And there was a, like a DEA agent or something there. And he actually, because he was armed, he was able to stop that whole thing. And she wound up on the news and she posted it. And I said to her, you know, it's too bad that there can't be more good guys with a gun there in New Jersey. Because like, what if that DEA agent wasn't there? Yeah. You know? And then she said to me, you know what, though, I worry about like what would happen if everyone had guns? What would happen there? You know, that would be scary. And I said to her, you know what, you OK, you're a paramedic and you go to car accidents all the time and people die from car accidents and bad things happen. But we all have we all have cars and people, ah, don't, you know, ah, but that's different <laughs> because that conveys you from A to B and everybody has a legitimate purpose for that. Your constitutional right, however, is an entirely different topic. So let's let's not even yeah. compare them. Yeah. Well, and what I'm trying to say is, you know, what I was trying to tell her is if everyone, you know, if, if and really even like here in Florida, I, t I was telling her that, yeah, we it's a lot easier for us to get guns here in Florida, but we don't have shootouts all the time. You know, so I try to have that conversation. And actually what wound up happening is she became a police officer. Her boyfriend became a police officer along the line. It didn't just happen overnight. When they came to visit me, I took them shooting, all that kind of stuff like what you're saying. And, you know, you can you can bring people over here if you don't just beat them up and, you know, and then make them go, yeah, this guy's totally batshit crazy. Well, and, <laughs> and then you goes, become the representative of every gun guy. And that goes to having the conversation with people. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you yeah, know, we, we talked about this a little bit before because I don't think we talked about it while we were while we mm -hmm. were alive. But having a conversation is not inherently let's make a compromise. Mm -hmm. Having a conversation is simply conveying ideas to an individual on the other side who may or may not be receptive to them, may or may not change their opinion about it, may or may not even think about what you're saying. But if you don't have the conversation and you don't have the conversation in a term in terms that are, are not going to be off-putting by like just constantly attacking them. No, you're wrong. No, you're wrong. Well, I, okay, if you're going to tell me I'm wrong, I'm not even going to listen to what you have to say. But if you have a conversation with someone, there's a much better chance that you may get somewhere. And the problem is that, for some reason, some people seem to think that conversation inherently means compromise. Compromise, by definition, is where two parties take something and they meet in the middle, right? They, they, they each say, okay, I'm over here, I'm over here, I'll meet you halfway. You know, mm -hmm. and when we're talking about gun stuff, like there, there isn't any more compromising because it's not a compromise if now we're starting 10 steps over to the left-hand side and now we're trying to compromise from over here. Like, no, compromise would be going back the other direction and then mm. to, to the other side. It wouldn't be just continuing to go down that road because now we're no longer meeting in the middle. We just keep going and going and going until everything's gone. Um, and I think that that is, you know, that's, that's fine to not want to do that. I'm with you there. I don't think that should be done. Mm -hmm. um but i you know I, yeah I think don't start don't start trouble don't start trouble adam <laughs> <laughs> you're saying the c word <laughs> no yeah yeah i know i'm just messing um, with you i know um yeah. and, and you know I, but really at the end of the day i think i think the biggest way you can advance gun rights isn't going to be by posting memes on facebook or writing nasty comments on on youtube videos or screaming that all gun laws are infringements the biggest way you can make a difference is going to be doing the heavy lifting and nobody wants to hear that because that requires involvement on their part. But it means getting involved, taking your friends and family and acquaintances to the range, explaining to them gun safety, getting them acclimated, like teaching them stuff mm -hmm. so that they can understand that this thing is not inherently evil like they're told. And the more people that get this kind of thing going, the less likely the media and other sources will be able to continue to say, oh, these things are terrible because people are going to go, what are you talking about? Like we, we as a majority now know that that is absolutely untrue. Yeah. Yeah. And I think a lot of things like the, like the, the containers or buckets we put people in don't matter. I see some folks are talking about this in the chat. So I'm going to bring it up. It's a little bit of a sidetrack, 
because uh, sure. you're talking about like Republicans and Democrats. And so people are talking about what I am. I'm technically in Florida registered as a Democrat. Lola is registered as an independent. Now, the problem with that is Florida has this stupid law where you can only vote for the party that you are registered with. Close, so if close you, primary? Yeah. And we I'm, are it. Yeah, yeah, we're independents that we're more, you know, I don't like I don't like the containers myself, but I'm closer to being like a libertarian. I don't like Republicans, don't like Democrats. The problem is, is that when she switched over, she she cannot vote in primaries if there if there isn't a, a uh, independent running in that primary. So most primary, she can't vote in it. And that's really right. stupid. And that's one of the things that we have to clean up. And a lot of us nowadays, you know, if you think about it, a lot of us don't want to identify with this party or that party. You know, of course, I could just switch my thing and become a Republican. That's mostly who I vote for. But here in the South, one of the things that you have to realize, there are some people I try to think about who I'm voting for. And if I know that person and I know that they're pro gun, let's say, you know, um, lots of people here in the South have been, you know, this this whole thing is really weird and people don't understand it. Right. But lots of people here in the South are just Democrats because their father, their grandfather, their great grandfather. People don't yeah, even. Every, every everybody and their mother was a democrat yeah people don't understand all this stuff you know there's lots of folks out there who think democrats were bringing all the freedom <laughs> and it's so yeah. it's so twisted and and convoluted that i don't even like to put myself into that category i'm a gun guy that's what i vote that's the number one thing that i think about when i'm voting we have we have closed primaries up here in pennsylvania too so i i know exactly what you're talking about as far as yeah. and you know depending upon what area of the state you're in it, it matters. So like, for instance, where I live, it, it's starting to turn purple, but it, it was a, it was a very red County for a very long time. Um, as far as voting goes. So if you wanted to say, at least at the stage of primaries of who's likely going to be a candidate, you were definitely a registered Republican. Cause that was the odds of the person who was going to ultimately end up in that position. Yeah. So if you wanted any say you, you were a Republican, so you could vote in that primary to get the guy that best represented you. So I, I totally yeah. understand, you know, it's a that weird thing. And we have to try to, I think, you know, sometimes you want to try to be strategic with it or whatever it is, but it's a silly thing. And I think if you're really just an independent, you should be able to do that. But the problem we have is like everything that we're fighting, even this gun control thing, we're fighting it on a local level, you know, in our cities and our states as well, like as on a federal level. Right. Yep. It's and everywhere. This, yeah, and this is what some people are saying. That's why folks are saying, "Yeah, well, California, we're never getting them." I mean, you know, California just made it legal for you to knowingly yeah. infect someone with AIDS. Yeah, and also a vote from prison as a felon. Oh my. Okay, I didn't even know. Yeah, well, did they just better. put that into effect? Also. Yeah, that was signed. Uh, I think it was last week. I saw that. Wow. Oh. Okay. Yeah. But you know, it goes back to the, the bigger conversation of uh, you know. And this is this is the part where I think people don't understand the reality of the political arena. Like you have, we have our ideals; they have their ideals. Somewhere in the middle is like how things actually are in the real world today. And the problem is, if you go from in the middle in the real world to saying no, we're going all the way to the other extreme, not one person is going to introduce that. Not one person is going to vote for it. It's not going to go anywhere. Like, if you look at the history of uh, even gun laws, you know, the first major uh, national one was the National Firearms Act of 1934. Then you had something okay. in uh, 38. Uh, I think it was the FFL ones, which established license. Uh, my timeline's a little screwed up in my head. Um, and then you didn't really have anything till uh, 68, I th think. Um, there may have been one before, but like if you, especially when, like in the context of Second Amendment as applied challenges, when we're looking at people who were prohibited persons, what what the law considers prohibited, it wasn't until I think the '60s where nonviolent misdemeanor crimes became a prohibiting offense. I mean, for the majority of the time this country has been around, you had to do something like murder someone or or commit a violent crime for the the government as a whole to be like, yeah, okay, no. Um, but if you look at this. What I'm getting at here is it's it's been incremental and over time. It wasn't just flat out, we're going to do away with everything. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are missing that when it comes to, okay, well, let's backtrack on that. Like, great. 
I'm all for the repeal of the NFA. I'm all for getting rid of the Hughes Amendment. I think we should totally do it. However, if you come out, I'll, I'll even draft what I'm half tempted to do, and I may do it, is draft the language to repeal all that stuff and put it up on my website. You find the person that's going to introduce it in Congress. That's my challenge to any of you. You find the yeah. person who's going to introduce it in Congress because you're not going to find them. Look at, look at the problem you're having with silencers, right? We can't even get Congress, after educating a number of them, to agree that silencers should be removed from the NFA. Yeah, they, they even the Republicans, they think it's like somehow a bad thing and they just don't. Uh, right. Yeah, they don't right. understand that. Yeah, right. And that's that's the you know, that's what you're up against. And these are the people you elect. So that means one of two things. Either you got to start electing different people or you have to start educating people as to like what these things really are. And it's not going to happen overnight. Just the same way that things were eroded away, you got to chip back the other direction to ultimately get to where you're going. Yeah. And it's and it's really kind of both. You know, and there's probably some other things that you have to do. You have to do all of those things. So we were talking a little bit about history. Um, why do you think we got that first stuff in the 30s? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, part of it was the uh, mobsters m murdering everyone over alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, it really, that's what it, you know, and the, the St. Valentine's Day massacre was really the precipitating event to the NFA going into effect. So by banning one thing, now yeah, they, they, they created just, they industry. Created a whole, yep, yeah, yeah. they created a whole crime empire that yeah. uh, and, and that spawned multiple industries, right, where or people were doing a lot of craziness. Yeah, yeah smuggling yeah. alcohol was, was huge, gambling. Um, but you look at that and, you know, the mobsters, you know, the, the Tommy gun, the Chicago typewriter. Wasn't called that because they were writing letters home. I'll tell you that much. Yeah. Um, you know, and so Congress saw all these people getting murdered, and there was this huge outcry from the public. They're like, well, we got to do something. Um, so rather than like maybe doing the smart thing and being like, we should get rid of prohibition, mm -hmm. uh, they're like, we should ban guns. And now here we go. <laughs> here we go. Um, yeah. And it started with you know what you find in the NFA without destructive devices, uh, you know, machine guns, silencers. Originally, handguns were supposed to be in that. A lot of people don't know that, but the NFA originally was supposed to include handguns as well. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, you, you look at the history of the NFA and everybody goes, well, the NRA is responsible for it. And yes, the NRA did have a part in it. Absolutely can't deny it. It's in the records. You know, it's out there. Uh, it is what happened. However, the NRA is, as I said earlier, a membership-driven organization. So if the members at the time didn't feel that that stuff was worthy of protection, it probably makes sense that the NRA as an organization didn't really care about stopping it. Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, not my not my viewpoint. I'm just making that clear to people listening. But, um, you know, if the members as a whole were like, yeah, uh, that's not really protected by the Second Amendment, in our opinion, um, you know, and you, you look at today's society, right? You have people who grew up playing video games. You have people who were in the military. You have people who uh, saw the assault weapons ban come and go, and they go, I need those things. I want those things. Those things are constitutionally protected. Things you didn't have happening back then. And the flow of information is a lot faster, too. Mm -hmm. um so you know yeah the, yeah the nra did support the nfa back then absolutely um but i would tell you that i think the nra of today is very different than of the nra of 1934. yeah also um, a lot of those dudes aren't here <laughs> yeah you know and and it'll be different um you know if it exists it'll be different 20 30 years from now yep you know um, so let me let me ask you this. Um, sure. Obviously, we've got a whole bunch of things that we have to chip away at on all kinds of levels, right? Mm -hmm. But um, I was having a conversation with a friend last night, and he made this point to me. I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you: Haven't we gotten some things? Or you know, is that true or not true? Have we gotten some things? Have we gotten some things under the short period of time that Trump's been there? But did we also get some things even under the time that Obama was there? Did that yes. happen, or did that not happen? Yeah, it did happen. Uh, so one of the things under the Obama administration that you can thank Congress for is that you can now carry a firearm in a national park, something you didn't used to be able to do. Um, and I know I personally am a fan of that because I like backpacking quite a bit mm -hmm. out in bear country. And I quite honestly don't want to be eaten by a freaking grizzly bear. So I carry a gun. Uh, and I also happen to do it in national parks. So this is good news for me. Uh, bad news for the bears or bad news bears, I guess. Horrible pun. <laughs> uh, um, under Trump, uh, the only thing that comes to mind was that he and Congress, there is a provision, there is a law in Congress that allows you to, within a certain period of time after an agency introduces a regulation, for Congress to go, no, 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 and repeal that. So what they did, and this made news, uh, of course, not correct news, but distorted news or fake news, 
Um, what they did was uh, the Social Security Administration had implemented this new regulation that anybody who was deemed mentally defective by the administration for being unable to manage their financial affairs, for being unable to manage their financial affairs, uh, would be reported to NICS as adjudicated mentally defective and would be a prohibited person. And Congress said, yeah, no, we're not, we're not doing that. So they, they did repeal that back. And the way that was touted by the media and all the Democrats was that the mentally ill are getting guns. Yeah, which, yeah. Which is not what was happening in the first place. Right, yeah. It's not like everyone who's batshit crazy can go out there and do this thing, you know. Right. This is, it's a very slippery uh, slope there. Um, I think we like there's also like a, another thing we might have possibly gotten, but the jury's still out. I mean, uh, Trump did get to put in a Supreme Court. Yeah, yeah, um, I saw that in the comments. Neil Gorsuch. Yeah. Um, so I, hopefully I, that was a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> what so, do you think and, on that one? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've read some of his opinions. He, in my opinion, he's a going to be a fantastic justice. Mm -hmm. He is somebody that I, uh, I I think if nothing else comes from the Trump presidency, Neil Gorsuch is going to be something that will be a, a legacy in, in and of itself. Really? You think so? Okay. So uh, why? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm t you, what you're saying on this has more weight for me because you know, you're into law, you're a law nerd. Mm -hmm. So why? <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> law nerd. That, that hurts. That hurts oh no, it's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. That's a good thing in this case. If you when, when I, when I need some law advice, <laughs> it's going to be awesome. If you, it, yeah, maybe if you read his dissent from, uh, and Justice Thomas joined it um, from the denial to hear, I can't remember if it was Peruta or not, but he basically accused the court of just not wanting to deal with the issue and that this stuff is very clearly, you know, constitutionally protected. Um, I I'll try and dig up that opinion and, and give it to you so you can put it in like the description or something because it was, it, it was some very strong, sharp language in there. And I, I think he gets it. Okay. I, I, I think from a standpoint of if you look at what the document says, this is what the document says, right? It's not, well, the document says this, and, you know, I think that, and popular opinion says this, so we should end up somewhere... Interpreting you know, it this way. Yeah, yeah. like, all the, okay. like no, th this is what it was. This is what it was understood to be at the time. Like, it, game over, man. Yeah. Okay, absolutely. And, um, you know, we're kind of running down on time here, so I can't get in too many more questions. Uh, we just got a couple more minutes. Uh, Mr. Trek Fan Dan wants me to ask you. Yes, the is Constitution is the supreme law of the land. Are you kidding? Is that actually a question? <laughs> yeah. Come on, man. He says, is the Constitution the law of the land? Yes or no? So um, I've never seen him in the chat here, but hey, you know. Huh? Um, this may he may not he may not be a fan of yours. <laughs> That's fine. Can't please everybody. <laughs> yeah, but I think uh, I think you got a clear answer on that one. So uh, Scott Kimball just gave us ten bucks. Thank you, Scott. We appreciate that. He says, "What do you think about the local state uh, Illinois, Tennessee, Ohio, New York, Massachusetts, Washington, PA, FL bills to ban on bump stocks triggers um, in?" Um, yeah. And then pair to minor HS three three nine nine nine. Uh, I'm he he says he's from Endicott. Endicott, New York. He's yeah, asking yeah. if I had speedies at Binghamton University. So for those that don't yeah. know, before I answer his question, yeah, this is so are, confusing. <laughs> speedies are uh, a thing that's like from that region of New York. Uh, they mm -hmm. have a speedy festival in Binghamton with a uh, a, a balloons actually. Um, but speedies are like marinated pieces of meat, usually chicken, and they're uh, grilled on a stick, and they're freaking delicious. So yes, oh, it's I like did, a shish kebab kind of thing. Yeah, kind of, okay. uh, only better. So yes, oh. I did have them. Um, as far as what do I think about the the local states' uh, bills to ban them, it's really going to depend on the state's makeup. Like here in Pennsylvania, for instance, we have a Democratic governor, but our uh, General Assembly, so our our version of Congress here, is uh, predominantly Republican. So as far as it making it through our, our General Assembly, I don't think it's likely. Now, whether or not it would um, pass in a state like New York or New Jersey or Massachusetts, yeah, or Illinois, yeah, it's more likely. Although I think in Illinois they had a vote on something earlier. Mm -hmm. um, 
I think they had I think they had a, a link uh, uh, or a vote on something earlier. I, I think it was gun related. I don't remember if it was on that or not though. So I'd be lying if I said. Okay, and then Scott just gave me another ten bucks to take uh, Lola to dinner for all the work she does. <laughs> I, I tell I tell you, man, if you can get you know get a speedy, but uh, you're not anywhere up oh, that way. So. Um, that sounds like when I lived in Nigeria, there was something called suya, and it was basically the same thing. It's like street meat. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Which is not what I know some people that have perverted minds. But <laughs> so basically <laughs> on the sides of the street they would have these guys selling these shish kebab things and uh, it was typically I'm going to assume it was beef, dude. I have no idea. <laughs> it tasted good, but you know what they did? They marinated it in in like peanuts and like ground up peanuts and pepper and stuff like that. And they called it suya for anyone who's from Nigeria and and it, I guess it's like speedies. So Yeah. But if I'm ever up there, I'll I'll check that out. Have you ever heard of a place called Equinuk? No. Oh, okay. Okay, that's a place in Pennsylvania that I've been to. Where, what part? It's I think it's in the uh, northeast. Where did you say you're in Pennsylvania? Uh, I'm in the southeast. Oh, southeast. Okay, yeah. yeah. That's up in the mountains of Pennsylvania. Yeah. So I, I mean, how the how the hell did Pennsylvania wind up with a Democrat uh, as a governor? <laughs> uh, Philadelphia. Honestly, it's in Philadelphia and, and Philly. Pittsburgh. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they, you know, if you look uh, at the sides of the state, the the yeah. two sides are very like blue when it comes to voting. Uh, and then if you look at you know the rest of it, it's all like just red. It's just like New York, man. New York City. Yep. runs it controls everything. everything. Yeah, and then everyone else has to live by that, which is just really, really, really crazy. Okay, let me see if there's any. Um, let me see if there's any other. <laughs> the Pyro 721 says bush meat in Africa usually comes from hominids. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, dude. I know when I was a kid, it was awesome. That's all I can tell you. So, I'm getting um, asked here, Pats or Genos. So if, if you've never been to Philadelphia, uh, the, the Philadelphia cheesesteak is like what people come for. Uh, mm -hmm. along with some other stuff but um there's yeah. two competing shops that sit across from oh, one yeah. another and yeah. there's like blood you know spilt over loyalty here yeah they're both terrible go to oh, they are? on south street oh okay there you go you got it from adam <laughs> the yeah. others are tourist traps <laughs> and i know i know that's not gonna be an acceptable answer either no but that happens right like everyone goes there and that's not even really the good food man yep so you said gyms yeah, Jim's on South Street is, in my opinion, it's the better cheesesteak. Okay. And when you go there, say Adam sent you, and then be like, no, oh, they would have no idea who I am. <laughs> yeah, they'll have no cool. idea. Give who us your that money. Is. We take yeah. cash. Uh, Chris B said McDonald's used to cook their fries in peanut oil. That's why they were so good. Now, not so much. Oh, I never knew that. That if you know if that's true, yeah, I did. That not makes sense. That you know, so why is peanut oil so bad? Oh, I would imagine if you had a peanut allergy, it probably would. Well, oh, okay, yes, <laughs> cause some issues. But I, I don't know. I don't know what percentage of the population that is. <laughs> not my problem. Yeah, I'm not giving one inch. <laughs> yeah. To those peanut oil allergy <laughs> having. Mofos. Listen, if you if you can't fly because you have a peanut allergy, get off the plane. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I want exactly. the peanuts. Yeah, I don't want to be held back because of I don't those want pretzels. Who wants that? Intolerant people. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, let me see. Okay, this is probably going to get a little bit uh, out of hand here. I don't know. Have the McDonald's fries gotten worse? I don't know. I don't. Eat, I don't eat McDonald's that much. Believe it or not. I, I honestly, the only fast food I'll touch is uh, Chick Fil A, and that's a oh. fairly infrequent occurrence. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of Chick uh, Fil A's down here. I call them Chick Fil A's, but I always get in trouble with Lola for that one. So <laughs> there you go. So the range one says, "I'm voting for you, Adam, for sure." Well, thank so, you. Yeah. What I want to do here in the, in the in a couple of minutes here, you know, I think we've been going to this for two hours. We can't hold Adam. I hope that you guys got a lot of questions answered. Um, I, I hope you have a better view of him now. I'm going to give you a chance, Adam, to um, you know give a final pitch here. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, you know, one of the questions that's always asked is why should I vote for you? I hope you you got some information, at, if nothing else. Um, you know, if, if you are a voting member and I happen to earn your, your vote, awesome. Uh, if not, sorry to hear that. Um, you know, you can go to my website, adamkraut.com. Uh, you can sign up for my newsletter there. You'll want to stay tuned because I am introducing some very exciting changes. I think they're exciting because I think it'll help restore some accountability to the organization. 
um, that will be coming out within the next week or so. Um, okay. We'll be doing videos uh, as far as you know structure. Uh, the plan is anyway to do videos as far as the structure and responsibility, so people have a better understanding of what the organization is and how it functions. Um, so that you can sign up for that on my website. You can learn a little bit more about me there. Um, if you want to contact me, you can contact me through the website. Uh, you can check out my Facebook page. It's uh, facebook.com slash Adam Kraut NRA. Um, yeah, otherwise, the legal brief on the Gun Collective, uh, where I don't tell you gun laws are unconstitutional because I'm trying to help you understand what they are and how to comply with them. Otherwise, you probably have a bunch of illegal machine guns in your house. And if not, then you can stop telling me that they're all unconstitutional. Yeah, absolutely. Um, lots of folks want to thank you, including Scott Kimball. He says thank you for coming on here. Um, Tyvin, Tyvin, the Tyvin show has like a quick thing. I'm gonna try to sneak in here really quick if you can answer this. He says if the Supreme Court ruled that we can have what the Army, etc., has and ruled yes, wouldn't that override the 1986 ban on machine guns? Uh, is there something like that in the Supreme Court right now? Read it one more time. Sorry. So he says if the Supreme Court ruled that we can have what the Army, et cetera, has and ruled yes, wouldn't that override the 1986 ban on machine guns? It would, de it would depend on what the actual language of the opinion was and when it was written um, also. Because if, if a law were passed after the fact, um, you know, if there were if there were a court opinion, so the, the way and this goes to how government functions, but essentially, if you you know Congress passes a law, it goes up to the Supreme Court, Supreme Court rules on it, uh, finds it unconstitutional, and Congress says, okay, well, um, we're going to tweak something, and then we're going to pass it again, and it goes back up, and it becomes a law. Then that's what the law is until the constitutionality of it is challenged, or Congress repeals it or, or alters it. Okay. Uh, and people, I've gotten several questions on this one uh, from Rock Humper. He wants to know King Shooter Supplies. <laughs> did, yeah, does that sound familiar? Did you yeah, work there or something? I did. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I was the the general manager of King Shooter Supply for a little over three and about a half years or so. Um, so, and that's the other thing about me that you know I've experienced both as you know, an enthusiast, both as uh, an attorney, as somebody who was on the other side of the gun counter, who dealt with the industry related stuff. So like, I get it. I have a smattering of stuff that not a lot of people can say that they have experience doing. Um, mm -hmm. And it makes me, I think it makes me a little more well-rounded and I understand some of the issues facing different groups that other people might not. Okay, cool. Uh, intro, uh, I'm sorry, Nitro Zoo 76 says great show, Hank and Adam. There you go. Thank you. Uh, Richard Maunder says, one of the best shows so far. Thanks, all of you. Um, and the Archangel says, about time Adam came on, the greatest show on YouTube, hands down. Okay. Um, you know, Adam has, like, not a lot of time. So I think you and Lola have been planning this for a while, right? Uh, yeah, we've, uh, yeah, for, for some time, yeah. Yeah. Um, she reached out to me, and, yeah, uh, of course, I would love yeah, to come absolutely. on. Absolutely, yeah. So there you go, and we'll and we'll try to keep getting other folks on here. Okay, um, someone wants to. Someone says I carry my revolver in single action. Ask ask him. Will AR pistol with ten round magazines fall under assault rifles ban? <laughs> uh, it, it would, it's going to depend on the the language, but I, my guess would be probably. Yeah, they're making those things like wide, right, to cover mm -hmm. everything. Yeah, so I mean, if you look at the original language in the assault weapons ban. Excuse me. The assault weapons bans. You know, they specifically named like Colt AR-15 and like Colt Sporter and AK-40, and now it's gone or like any kind of clone thereof or any kind of derivative thereof. So we've gone from a very specific like item to like, anything that kind of looks like this or yeah. has a similar name or or just generally. Yeah, if you even have a dream that you're gonna modify, yeah, you're gone. And then the whole thing is like they're gonna have to establish a rate of fire. I mean, that could get comp. Maybe we should have Adam on again some. Time. I don't know. Yeah, I, I'd be I'd be delighted to come back <laughs> yeah. at some point. Should you choose to have me, we can certainly yeah. talk about a whole host of other things too. Yeah, but that's the thing, right? Because they're going to have to establish what's a rate of fire. Well, and that's that's the biggest problem with that bill. So I, you know, I mentioned earlier that my congressman is a co-sponsor of that bill, and his office, local office, happens to be in the town where I live. So I decided I always preach. Yeah, you know, I practice what I preach, right? I'm always telling people you need to pick up the phone, you need to be involved, you need to do stuff. So what did I do? I went to my congressman's office. I went inside. I talked to the staff because he wasn't there. And I sat down and I expressed my concerns with the bill. I said, from first of all, just from a, a, a standpoint of uh, 
being opposed to such a thing, I am opposed to it. But here's some other problems with it. Uh, like the ambiguity of rate of fire of a semi-automatic. How the hell does one define that? Um, it, 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 like, and, and, you inherently yeah, can't crazy. do it. No. Uh, and now, now the problem is you're creating a whole slew of issues because ATF is going to have to figure that out because they're tasked with interpreting the Gun Control Act. I, yeah, I don't want the ATF figure, figuring it. Right. And, then, and then it'll go to court. <laughs> and then courts will have to figure it out. And like you're, yeah. just crea you're creating a mess. So I yeah. went in there and I, I really let her have it about he should not be a co-sponsor of this bill. This is absolutely unacceptable. And I said, and why I'm here, uh, you know, I'd also like this voice support for national reciprocity. I also want him to vote for the SHARE Act when it comes up for a vote. Uh, and I explained, you know, everybody talks about SHARE Act in the sense of silencers. And I said, silencers are great and good, but there's also other very important provisions in there, including interstate transportation, things that would help people who travel through states like New Jersey, New York, where they're getting pulled over and arrested. This would protect those individuals. And surprisingly, she looked at me and she said, you know, silencers aren't nearly as quiet as they are in Hollywood. I said, listen, lady, <laughs> I own silencers. I have friends who own silencer companies. I work at a, a shop that sells them. Like, I'm good with silencers. I want them. You know, mm -hmm. they should be over the counter. But there are other things in that bill that are great that we as gun owners should be demanding from Congress to protect us. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, we could go on with this. Here's what I'm going to do. I hope you guys, one, realize where Adam's at. You know, I hope you guys have a better picture of what's going on here. And we will make some plans if we can get him on. I know he's really busy doing a bunch of things, including uh, working with John at the Gun Collective. And, yes, we're going to try to get John on. So, you know, that's going to happen. Um, or we'll, we'll try to do that. So, um, but I, I, we can't keep Adam here. So I'd like to thank you, Adam, for coming on. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having yeah. me. I had, a, I had a blast yeah. doing this. So hopefully really, we can, we can do it again sometime. Yeah. Anytime you can get like a free conversation with a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> None of that was legal advice. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. So let's, yeah, let's caveat that. But Hey, anytime you could even just talk to a lawyer, <laughs> you know, you don't have to pay money. It's you a not, not get a bill. It's a good yeah. day. I had to sneak in a lawyer joke. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's fine. So yeah, I want to thank you. I want to thank everyone in the chat. We have lots of people, even right now, we've got lots of people in the chat hanging out. So thanks to everyone. Um, I want to thank everyone who supports us on Patreon. It's Patreon slash Hank Strange. Of course, I want to thank the uh, folks that sponsor us. That would be Safety Harbor Firearms, Rand CLP, Andrew's Custom Leather, and of course, Big Daddy Guns that gives us the studio and lets us do all of this, say whatever the hell we want to. So thanks a lot uh, to them, and uh, peace out to everyone. Just stay right there, Adam. But we are out of here, guys. Thanks a lot. Peace out. Good night.